I've got a dog hair on me. And here's another dog oh, hair on me. Lovely. Here's another dog hair oh, on me. Oh, that sweater, I bet it tracks it like crazy. I know. Do you I have the lint roller? We got a lint roller. Nah, it's all right. You sure? Yeah, this is far away enough. I don't think anybody can see all the <laughs> dog right. hair. People are going to watch on their phone anyway. Yeah. Or not at all. But yeah, no, other than that, <laughs> I'm good to go. It's extra layers. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, you do a lot of layers. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 73 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about if removing the nib and feed from your pen constantly will wear it out over time. Uh, we're going to talk about how we choose our pen cast questions. We have a question about our leadership philosophy and like where we've learned some of that. Uh, dealing with a loose converter and can you fix that fitting in your pen? We have our basically our story of you know how we upsized from the garage to the warehouse and how we made that decision. We're going to be spotlighting the Pilot Vanishing Point LS, which has been sort of revamped a little bit. So we're going to throw a little bit of love on that. And we're going to talk about our holidays because we're back after Christmas. So, that we are. Uh, you'll notice the absence of specifically holiday themed sweaters. Though you have what looks like a very cozy cardigan going on. Oh, there, on here. there will be more sweaters. There, there, I, yeah. I have retired the very Christmassy ones, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, you know, with the trees and the snowflakes. But yeah, there, yeah. there are others that you got, will you stick got, around for the remainder of the winter. You got a strong sure. sweater game, both holiday on and off holiday season. Yeah. Oh, I'm not done yet. Nice. Is that a cardigan technically, or is that a sweater? It's a cardigan, I think. Cardigan? What makes it a cardigan? I don't, I don't actually know. know. Button-up sweater, you could probably say. Yeah. Is it always a sweater? Is a cardigan like within the sweater family? I think so, but they can be really thin too. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, I don't really know. Anyway. Or jumper. Jumper. All right. Well, anyway, we're gonna talk about pens, and we're gonna start it off with some feedback. Yes. All right. One came to us from JS Matlock. And JS says, I loved hearing the Brian and Drew origin story. <laughs> when Drew started talking about Shannon bursting into tears while in Brian's garage because she knew that that was where Drew needed to be, I started crying too. Aww. The relationship between you two is so heartwarming. Aww. Uh, you must always do <laughs> weekly podcasts and you must always do them together. Whoa. Well, okay. This coming while we took last week off, ironically. Oh, we must not um, always do a podcast, but mostly do podcasts. We I, most. I will say today's podcast almost didn't happen because Rachel was like, "Do you really? Do you really need to do one this week?" And I was like, "I mean, we planned on it if we're feeling okay." She's like, "Really? Do you really need to?" She's like, "You can't take a break." And I was like, "I like doing it though." Yeah. So anyway, it worked I out. I like it. Yeah, it worked out. <laughs> and then I don't know if you remember or you. But Probably last time we talked about that weird corner cabinet in the kitchen that we all have oh, where yeah. you can have access to the front of it, but then to the side of it, there's that no man's land where mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. have your random junk. And I asked people, what is your random junk in the side? So <laughs> yeah. uh, Matthew Goldberg says that mm. he, he's got a walk back there mm. and an ice cream maker. And I was like, Ooh, yes. Ice cream maker. That's a perfect Well, for I thought walk thing. was a perfect one because I've had a walk before and okay. I have never used it. It seemed like such a good idea. A giant mm. bowl, you can just, I can do all sorts of stuff in here. Yeah, yeah. It's so huge. But I can't, because it only, like, it's a big bowl, yeah. but it only gets hot at the very bottom of it. So it's like, mm. I don't know, it's weird. I couldn't figure it out. So it just, it stuck around. I always thought I'd have a better use for it though. And I never did. So a yeah, walk to me, I, that, that hit personal for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone else said salad spinner. I thought that was great. Oh yeah. Because in concept that's a great idea mm -hmm. you're like oh of course i need a salad spinner you can rinse everything get the oh, water yeah. out it's the kind of thing you buy when you're on a health kick and you're like i'm gonna eat salad all the time yeah. and then you're like salads are a lot of work and they don't taste that great i think i'll buy yeah. some food that tastes better and is yep. less work but salad spinner is a solid one mm -hmm. and then uh susan says brewing support brewing supplies because oh, wow. Susan brews pop, wine, and cider. Okay. So that was an interesting one. Hmm. And then finally, uh, Jenny says, grandmother's Christmas dishes, including her gravy boat. Gravy boat. Oh, yeah. So, yes, like gravy sentimental boat. dishes you don't use, but you also can't get rid of. I've mm -hmm. got a few of those as well. For so, sure. All good answers. All good answers. Mm. I didn't see as many... Uh, uh, random apparatuses as I thought I would see in the comments. I was like expecting a, more- Like a spiralizer? Yes, or like a, one of those sandwich presses or something like mm -hmm. that. Oh, yeah. So I was a little in, 
didn't. I was surprised that I didn't uh, have as many of those gadgets hmm. um, as I thought. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I have just been suckered into buying too many of those. I have three miniature waffle irons, um, and then a, oh. I have three. I mean, you are a waffle fan, so I'm that kind of makes sense. Well, you know me. I are they like different food. shapes or something? Like do I they have, serve? I have one that's just a, a mini waffle okay. maker. I have one that's a mini waffle maker that has a Christmas tree on one side. Okay. I have a mini pancake maker. And then I have a full-size waffle maker that's just kind of the press, you okay. know. And yeah, then I yeah. have the griddle, which is, a, is what I use for, you know, big pancakes. pancakes yeah. And then I have another waffle maker that is the press and turn style. Oh, like at a hotel? Like, like it, a makes, hotel. it makes Mickey hotel waffles. Makes. Oh, I've seen that. The one, they, they, they exactly. It's like the Disney one, yeah? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. it's the okay. Disney one. It was far more expensive than it needed to be. Of course, um, it's brand new. But yeah, so I have about six different <laughs> waffle. That's a lot of waffle makers. Pancake making devices, yeah. I have a George Foreman grill that has like a waffle tray that you like, oh. like interchangeable plates that Ooh. you can do, which we don't do this that often. Because yeah. for me, like making waffles is a lot more work than making pancakes, you know? And my kids prefer different things. Like sometimes they want sprinkles, sometimes mm -hmm. they want chocolate chips, whatever. Pancakes are great because you can just throw the pancakes on there and you're like, oh, you want some sprinkles? You want some chocolate chips? And you can like divvy it up. Mm -hmm. Whereas waffle, you got to like commit to the batch. You know what I mean? Yeah. More or less. I can understand that. Yeah. What are you going to do? That's it. Cool. All right. Uh, I got some feedback here from Armando Placencia. Bound you guys about five to seven months ago when I was researching supplies for learning calligraphy. Ever since then, you guys have become an integral part of my day. Love the pen cast and have fallen down the fountain pen rabbit hole thanks to the both of you. I now have two Lamy Safaris, an LX 50th Anniversary Edition, and a Pilot MR. Thank you guys for being so genuine and honest with every video you've made. God bless you and yours. Happy holidays. Very cool. Very cool. Thank Warming. you. I love it. I love that after doing this so long, we're still reaching new people. It blows me away when this. someone like yeah. stumbles onto fountain pens through this. Yeah. Which is not like what we intended. We, we were like, oh, the like through the pen cast specifically. The, yeah. The people that watch this are going to be, you know, already. Yeah, we were like, this is for the hardcore folks. But it's not <laughs> like we, we hear about a tremendous amount of people actually like stumbling upon this first. Yeah. We're like, wow, these Fair dudes enough. are excited about some pens. Maybe I'm, <laughs> what was the deal with these? <laughs> we are, we are excited about some pens. Uh, and I got one more from Love Charmaine. Uh, the feedback about how you guys bring light to us is definitely true. The videos you guys put out not only is entertaining, but also I learn something new every time. Love the pencast so much. It's like sitting down with friends catching up. I'm going to miss y'all next week, which was last week. Now we're back. Very cool. It is like sitting down with friends. That. I love it. I don't see all of you, but I, I feel we, it. We know you're there. I feel like one gigantic there. couch with everybody on it. Just a couch. All yeah, right. that 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 is where chill chilling happens. All right, I'm, we're all I'm in the living that. room together. I'm talking that. about nerdy stuff. Very cool. Speaking about nerdy stuff, we got some new things to talk about. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. All right, we are in the season of the year where maybe not as much new stuff is happening. Some doldrums. Yeah, it's a bit of a lull. Sort of intentionally, you know, a lot of people have had holidays. Yeah, well, these manufacturers, you know, they want to get things out before Christmas. Yeah, and a lot of them shut down. They're doing inventory and stuff for the end of the year. So less new releases are happening now through probably the next couple of weeks, which is fine. So um, I got a little light to shed on a pen that we don't have many of, and very few people will want slash afford. Uh, but it is a very cool pen, the Pelican Phoenix Machia. So this is their limited edition Machia. They do usually one every year, right? In an M1000. Sometimes it's an M800, but I feel like they've been doing M1000s mostly. Um, and uh, I don't know, this is a gorgeous looking pen. It's got a it Phoenix is. on it. It's very cool. It's expensive, yep. but it looks rad. And this is Japanese Machia. Yeah. On a German pen. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think they outsource it like to somebody from Japan. I mean, yeah. like, they're not like at the Pelican factory mm -hmm. doing this, I don't think. The only the only other like non like Asian Machia like manufacturer that I know would be ST DuPont is doing, but they're they're doing Yurushi lacquer. It's not really yeah, they're the not same doing like Machia. I mean, that really is, I think, I mean, mostly Japan, I think. Yeah. So I don't really, I mean. I'm sure there's some out there, but of, perhaps, the, of the major brands. At least I the ones, yeah, the major brands that we know, I think there may be one other, like some like independent, like yeah. artists and stuff like that who maybe are elsewhere, but of, of all the major companies yeah, that definitely you know, we've ever ones. seen, yeah, they're all Japan. For sure. So I think it's some kind of collaboration. They like, you know, because I think there's like, you know, I think Namiki has in-house Maki artists. But I think, you know, generally speaking across like Maki in general, it's not just pens. 
that Maki has done on. It's done on all kinds of stuff, dishware all and sorts. furniture and, you know, boxes and like decorative items. And pens are the Pens are outlier. kind of obscure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think most Maki artists are, I'll, I'll call it, say like more like freelancer contractor types who are doing all kinds of different products for different companies. So, you know, company like Pelican might like source it out. I don't know. I'm speculating. I don't have any specific information around that. But anyway, if you're interested, go check it on our site. It's a beautiful pen. Yes, indeed. Yep. Uh, also came out was the Twisby Eco T in Royal Jade. Oh, yeah. And this is a pretty pen, Brian. Looks hot. It is the first Eco that I have seen that has rose gold internal hardware. Yeah. Usually um, it's just the trim. Yeah. And like the nib. So but, it's, yeah. a, it's a fan. Now, the, the internal rose gold is like more of a satiny rose gold, not as much of a chromey high gloss rose gold as the exterior yeah. trim is, yeah. but it still has a beautiful vibe to it. The green and the rose gold to me fit so well together. Yeah. I love when yellow gold or rose gold is paired with earthy colors like green mm. or mm -hmm. gold or like like marigold, gold, uh, green, marigold yeah. or brown. Mm -hmm. I just think that works really well together. Because normally I'm, I'm, I'm a silver trim type of guy. Oh yeah, but same. when you get into those rich, you know, earthy colors, then gold trim yeah. I think looks really good, and this one I think looks really good. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same vein. It's like I I generally I think my taste reflects what most manufacturers put out and what most you know end users are probably into as well. Yeah, it's like I'll default to rhodium trim pretty much most of the time, but for certain colors I'm like, oh yeah, a rose gold or a yellow gold would make this really pop. Yeah, and, and this one's interesting because it comes in a gift box with a bottle of Midnight Blue. Yeah. And to my knowledge, this is the first time Twisby has done, in I've the States seen. anyway. Yeah, they've, they've done other like special editions they might outside have done, the US. Yeah, they might have done like a box edition when they did those funky resin pens that were like super rare. But yeah, yeah, I've but never seen is... a box, a presentation like this in the US. So it's pretty new. It's but of course, it, it comes with the standard silicone grease and the, you know, wrench. Mm -hmm. But uh, the presentation is very different and very new. So it is, yeah. it's it's pretty up there for a Twisby. I believe it's in the neighborhood of 75. So yeah, for an it's, Eco, it, it's a bit much, but there's a whole lot more that's going into it, especially if you factor in the price of the ink bottle. So presentation's awesome though. Yeah. So, I mean, Twisby's presentation is normally very good yeah. anyway. I don't know how limited this is going to be. They're not calling it a limited edition, so, but it definitely- yeah, I don't it, know. The, you'll, it looks like it's not going to, it just has the- It looks special, it like looks it's special, not going to yeah. be around forever. <laughs> yeah. that, but then again, the Twisby Prussian Blue uh, 580 is still around. So we thought that was going to be limited too. So who knows? Yeah. They might just make it until it stops being popular. Uh -huh. um, and then just one little reminder, uh, I was asked by Adrian, our customer care manager, to remind mm. everybody that the bottom shelf has been restocked. So we have a bunch of cool new additions to the discounted bottom shelf section of the website. Mm. Well, it's been restocked as of Tuesday when we're filming this. By Friday, it'll be completely empty. And you'll go there and be like, why did you say that there was stuff mm. in there? <laughs> I, I, I believe that it'll I'm still be there. There'll probably still be stuff in there. Check but it out. This is a time of year where we do get more bottom shelf items just because of increased volume and you know people return more Holiday things. Holiday returns, yep. Yeah, but anyway, check it. Check it regularly. Yes. Because we'll have more coming. All right, let's get on to some Q&A. All right, Drew, we're moving it along here. Yes. All right, question number one is from Lisa this week. And Lisa asks, mm. can the friction fit of the nib feed mm. get worn out by pulling the feed out too many times? That's a good question. You I know, thought that was a really good question. I've never been asked that before. Yeah, I mean, it is. I, I think the bigger, you know, risk when pulling out the nibs and feeds is, you know, if you, especially at the beginning, the first time you do it, it can be in there kind of tight. I'm thinking specifically like maybe a Twisby feed yeah. or something where the fins are maybe a little more delicate. And the first time you pull it out, it's going to be in there a little tighter because it's been sitting in there maybe for a while. It's kind of a tight fit to get in there. Sailor and Platinum are also usually pretty tight They can tight be pretty me. tight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're... They're friction fit. They're they're serviceable. You know, they're made yeah. to be taken apart without glued. like special tools. Most most of them. I mean, we are having to speak super generally across all pens, all brands. Most of them are user serviceable, able to be taken out just fine. But like anything else, if you're doing something over and over and over again, there's a potential for possibly damaging it or dropping it or doing you know causing some kind of damage. Or you know, it's basically like plastic parts. So the more you use them. Yes, they will eventually wear to a degree. So I would say, yeah, I mean, it may wear over time. I personally, you know, my pen hygiene is maybe not the best. So as we've discussed on the pen gas. So I do often find a benefit to removing my nibs and feeds when it comes time to clean my pens. Now I'm not doing that that often because I'm not cleaning my pens that often. 
if you are like super, you know, regular about cleaning your pens and removing the nib and feed, you're doing that constantly all the time, like every two weeks, every month. I could see where over time, maybe there would be somewhere, but I don't think it would be to the point where it would be like unusable. Like it's not like the nib and feed would like not friction fit in the pen anymore. No, you might notice I've never it being, really heard of that happening. You might notice it being a little easier. Yeah, but like it'll loosen up a bit, I've but not even, enough to where it like would fall out when you're writing. No, even with the pens that I've serviced the most, mm -hmm. I've never noticed anything ever getting so loose that it concerns me. Yeah. So, you know, I think the, I think the answer here is like from a like a textbook, like technical standpoint, it would be like, yeah, it'll wear out over time. But from like a practical standpoint of how often are you using any one individual pen and taking out the nib and feed so much that you would actually like wear that thing out? I think the odds are extremely low. Yeah. Unless there was just something crazy about the way that you were taking out, you were causing like some undue wear, you know. Even if you did it, it sounded like you said underwear. Undo wear. <laughs> it's two even, different words. <laughs> even if you did, if you cleaned it and refilled it and pulled the nib and feed every week for years, I still don't think that would be enough to have any noticeable impact. I mean, probably not. I, I don't think I've ever, other than like somebody, you know, damaging it, dropping it, you know, yeah. doing something, you know, atypical. I think before. Uh, I've never that, heard of anybody wearing out. After that many times, I think it's far more likely you would accidentally bend it or snap off a post yeah. or snap off a fin or something like that before just wear and tear would make any yeah. noticeable impact. So maybe it's not so much that it would like wear away like the friction fitness of it. It's just that, you know, every time you take it out, you're risking potentially causing some kind of damage. Yeah. It depends on the you feed. Know. Some, yeah. all feeds are different in terms of how fragile they are. Platinum is one of the ones I'm always the most careful with because mm. the post on the end of that feed, oh, yeah. very long, very thin, mm -hmm. and that can easily get snapped off. Um, yeah. Especially if you're kind of pulling with a, like a, ah, like motion like that. Cause sometimes you have to get it really close to you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not pulling at a nice plateau, yeah. uh, you could end up snapping that thing off. So I've I'm really with, careful with those. I've done that with Twisby. I've bent Twisby posts on the back of the feed. Plenty. Twisby posts I'm okay with, but I've definitely folded some fins. Oh yeah, folding the fins. You can sort of bend them back, but I've I've damaged them. You can fold them back once. What? Yeah. Once you do, you the try to do it the twice. Twisby feeds are like a softer plastic. They are. They so. are. And I, I've snapped a lot of feeds off of. I want to say it's Monograppa. I think they have like long posts on the back of theirs. Oh, are you talking about not not the ones on the that come the on feed. the Yovo nibs? You're talking about their Ebonite ones. Mm, I don't remember. I'm failing to remember now. I, okay. don't know, I don't know if it's the Ebonite ones. I don't think those have posts on the back. I can't remember. For for the last couple of years, they've mm. been made by the nibs have been made by Yovo. Maybe I'm thinking got, of old. Maybe I'm thinking of older ones. Then. Maybe maybe it was pre Yovo. Mm. I don't know, but anyway. So basically, if you're as long as you're doing it properly and you're not like bending your arms too much and like f putting force on it while you're doing it, if you're just removing it and putting it right back as you should, I don't think you're going to wear it out. Not enough that you need to like really be concerned about it or change your behavior at all. No. And so. if you're using, it depends on the inks too, because if you're using the same basic family of colors and you're not using any ink with a sort of high maintenance feature to it, yeah. you shouldn't need to uh, pull your feed every time. You yeah, can just really flush, flush that out. Mm -hmm. But again, some of us have different habits as far as their pen cleanliness goes. Yes. So sometimes it needs to happen. There you go. All right. Next question. This is for you, Drew. Hey. Alan asks, Drew, how do you choose which pe which questions to put in a pen cast? Do you write them on index cards and throw them from the stairs? Or maybe have a robot with a giant database? Um, no robot with a database, though I do like the mm. idea of flinging cards. I was kind mm. of obsessed with David Letterman when I was in elementary school for some reason. I okay. even dressed him for Halloween one time. But he always, when he would mm. read a question, he'd just... Fling it, you know, I just, I love the idea of flinging cards. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. just uh, yeah, okay. behind a desk, flinging questions. Uh, maybe I should write those on questions and- And fling it after we Sometimes you try to hit the camera. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, I I'm into that. that. I remember that. But uh, no, um, really, it just depends. Uh, we've been doing these so long that we could probably start repeating some questions and we have, we've got listeners and viewers that wouldn't mind. And Brian has been doing Q and A so many times, you know, well over 200. <sighs> that like thousands at, at some yeah. point there are, yeah, I mean, and how many questions in each of those episodes? So like- Oh, many. <laughs> so at some point things are going to get repeated. So I'm not super concerned about repeating questions every now and then because some questions, even 
when I do solicit questions, I see the same ones over and over and over again. So I usually wait. And if I do repeat them, I, 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 I like to wait a good long while to do that because it's still good information and it's still mm -hmm. getting to new people. So it needs to happen every now and then, but I try to give a gap and I monitor how often people ask the same question because sometimes it's a question that I either don't think is entertaining or educational, but then if enough people ask it, I'm like, well, it doesn't matter what I think because pe people clearly want to hear people it. So, want to hear whatever we have to say. Right, yeah. so um, then there's that. And then there's obviously a time factor as well. Like today, I've got two mm -hmm. questions on here that could potentially have somebody talking uh, ad infinitum. Um, somebody, huh? And on those days, I might pick a question like, someone asking how I pick questions, which is a relatively <laughs> simple and quick <laughs> question to answer, which leaves plenty of room for other things to happen. Yeah. So this right here is me paying attention to <laughs> questions. Yep. <laughs> That's about it, Alan, though. Thank you. Yeah. We try to be cognizant. I mean, I think there was like one pen guest I remember earlier on where we literally took the same question that we had answered like a two, couple, two weeks, a couple prior, of weeks yeah, before. it wasn't long, and both of us forgot that we answered it. Oh, it was a like, it was a question about like ADD or um, <laughs> neurodivergency right. or something like that. That's so it was right. really ironic at the that's fact right. that you know the two of us happened mm -hmm. to do that, and it's like, well, well yeah, surprise, surprise, yep, mm. yeah. But yeah, in general, I mean, I think we we try to be somewhat cognizant of that, but also because this is such like an open format, and we have like loose notes, but we riff quite a bit, even if we have a similar question or whatever. You're gonna get a different answer, you know, even if it's the same. The verbal same consistency question. is not our forte. Yes, indeed. All right. Next All right. up. Next this up is, is from your, Adam. Your question for me, yeah. Yes, and here right. we go. This is one of those that I alluded to. I'd love to hear, this is Adam, okay. I'd love to hear from you and Brian on your approach to leadership, mm. lessons learned along the way, oh my gosh. and what content you've read, watched, listened to that has helped inform your leadership philosophy. This is like. <laughs> A college degree of a right. question. This is why here. I took that other question, Alan. This is why. So that I can include things like this. There was like so many paths I could go down with this question. I was like, I'm going to keep it a little more surface level, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, because... you, you've you read a ton of books on leadership and management and all yeah. of these philosophies and principles. Like you have absorbed way more content that you've forgotten than you've learned. Like it's yeah, so I, much. I have to keep a list of the books I've read because I yeah. can't remember all of the books and they all, you know, being honest, I've, I think I've read somewhere around 150, 160 books in the like the business leadership, personal productivity, like professional development type space. I'll, yeah. I'll lump all those into one kind of category, yeah. you know, and, and part of that is because number one, I started this business when we were 25 and I knew nothing. So I either had to learn things the hard way or read a book about it and maybe learn something from somebody else's hard knocks so that I might make less of a mistake myself. You know, it doesn't always work out. Sometimes you still have to make the mistakes. But, you know, basically just trying to, I don't know, fuel inject my knowledge so I make fewer mistakes. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, reading, I'm a big like leaders are readers, you know, type, whatever advocate. I'm, I think that if you don't know something, like a book is such an inexpensive way to learn something. And not even just in the leadership space. If you want to learn how to knit or sew or whatever, you know, now we have so many more options because you have videos and all kinds of other things. So I do plenty of that stuff too. Um, so I would say that like as the leadership, whatever, I've gained a lot more experience. So I'm not consuming quite as much of the content that I used to early on. For a while though, you were ripping through those books. Oh yeah, I would rip through books. I would read, you know, read. And listening, read yeah. Audiobooks, once I got into audiobooks, things really kicked up. Yeah. You know, around the time when I was like 30, I was cycling like crazy. So I was a lot of time on a bike, just kind of sitting there. It's like, might as well listen to an audiobook, you know? So I was listening to a book every like three to five days, you know, which I'm a super slow reader. So reading an actual book is kind of painful for me. Um, but if it's important enough, I'll like listen to the audiobook. And if I really like it and it's got some more, especially if it's more like, data heavy stuff like if i'm reading a book about you know finance type stuff like the more the finance type of side of business Ugh. yeah less on the like leadership you know people side you know the the finance side there's like numbers and graphs and charts and things to refer to then i'll like actually buy the hardcover copy of the book 
and refer back to it yeah. or maybe listen to it while I'm flipping through the book. I know sometimes um, you've bought the audio book and then mm -hmm. went back and bought the physical book. Absolutely. Because yeah. you wanted a little bit more of a reference, you know. Yeah, yeah. Once book, I bookmarks and pages and principles and things yeah, like that. Yeah. I mean basically like the time that I have to sit down and read a book. I mean, it's great if I want to fall asleep early because, you know, I work all day, I got kids and all that. By the time I sit down at night, the rest of my day is done and I sit down to read a book, I'm going to pass out. No, you chair. don't have enough mental like, <laughs> fortitude for that. But if I'm like, you know, cooking or washing dishes after dinner or something like that, mowing the lawn, doing that type of stuff, I can listen to an audiobook while I do that stuff and it, and pick up, you know, a decent portion of what's going on in the book. And then if I'm like, oh yeah, this book is really good. There's a lot more here. I want to study it, you know, more intentionally. Then I'll buy the book and I'll read it. So that's kind of the process that I eventually honed in on. Uh, but when I started out, I didn't, you know, this was back in what, 2009, 2010. There just weren't as many like good, like audio options and not as many streaming services and things like that. So um, it was a little more practical for me to just like get a book. Um, so, um, but there's also, I think I read somewhere that there's like 11,000 business books published every year. So like the catalog of like self-help and leadership development, all that kind of stuff is massive. Yeah, I know self-help books are like the biggest, you know, genre in the industry, right? Yeah, and it's like it, some books can blur the line yeah. between the two of them. I'm not big on self-help per se, because I think, you know, it can. it is an industry that can easily be preyed upon and taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's, you can just look at, you know, if all these self-help books really worked, like we would have no problems because everybody would have fixed themselves, right? So there's definitely, you can be a serial self-helper. Um, so I'm, I'm a bigger fan of like the books where it's from a, you know, from like a leadership side, it's like somebody who has a story to tell, talks about their actual experiences, not so much of like, principles and concepts and ideas because especially when you're talking about running a business you can have all the best theories and ideas in the world but like that stuff doesn't matter you know it's like i think there's a mike tyson quote that says everybody's got a plan until they get in the ring and get punched in the right, face yeah you know it's like that's very kind of apt for a business um you know metaphor as well it's like everybody's got a great business plan until you get out there and start trying to sell and do your taxes and make strategic business decisions. You know, it's very, very different. Um, so I'm a big fan of, you know, actual business people with a track record. Usually they're probably like later in their life, they've kind of made their career and they're writing a book, they're giving talks, they're doing that kind of thing because they're speaking, you know, they're at that stage of life where they're kind of like giving back a little bit more in that, that mentor type space. Um, so um, that's more, kind of what I'm into. If like the only business experience they have is writing books and doing seminars, and that's like all they do, I don't really take that kind of stuff quite as seriously because that is their business. And I'm like, that's great if you want to learn a business about how to do self-help. Yeah. But it's more like, you know, those who have, you know, done something. So like I'll read autobiographies of like people that have, you know, done actual business things. And yeah, they'll write a book, but they're not like making their living off of that book per se. But I mean, being real, everybody writes a book because they want to sell books. Sure, that's kind of the point. But you know, but there's le there's there's less of a uh, you know um, kind of questionable motive when you know that someone isn't yeah, you, you, solely you, making their living off of this book. Someone that has yeah. made their living, they're good financially. They're doing this for we're you know a lot of it. Sometimes also has to do with like self reflection. Like, hey, yeah. I'd like to. I, I've learned all this. Like. Some people do, genuinely do want to help others. We're at, we're at a very interesting time right now. And I've like observed this since we, this business is about 13 years old. You know, I'm an elder millennial, right? So I'm I'm not at the, the, the sunrise phase of my career. I'm more kind of high noon, there maybe we go. 11 o'clock. Sure. So I've got some perspective here. Starting out now, there's so many resources for this like leadership type stuff, but there's also so much garbage yeah. out there. Like I've never seen so much, you know, garbage in terms of like the fake gurus and the, you know, posturing and people running ads on, especially on like Instagram and TikTok and these channels, I'm plenty on YouTube as well, that there's actually now like a whole <laughs> kind of industry around people who are like uncovering scammers around, 
I mean, all these different things, but like leadership seminar type stuff and all that, you know, and I'm not going to name any specifically because I haven't like deeply studied this a lot, but I just, I know enough from like my own experiences and having like actually done business things. And when I see other people's like with the, they got a private jet and like a wad of cash and I'm like, it's so much easier. No one does that. Yeah. It's so much easier nowadays <laughs> with social media to cultivate an image than it was before. Oh, yeah. Before you had the, to- The wantrepreneur, right? right? There, before yeah. social media, if you wanted to present an image, you basically had to present it as you met somebody. Yeah. Like in person, this is my image that I'm, I'm trying to sell myself. You, you had one chance to do it. You had to dress a certain way, act a certain way. But now you've got this whole platform behind you that kind of sells you. Like, this is my image. Look, see, look at all these pictures. See, that's, that's, that's me. But yeah. it's- it's so much more, it's just so much more deceptive in a lot of different ways. Well, there's always been like the guru types that have kind of like sold the selling process, mm -hmm. right? Where the selling process is them selling their selling process, yeah. you know? And it's like, it seems very appealing, but like, I don't know, you you sniff out a few of those and then you're like, no, nah, there's like no actual substance here. And, and I've never seen more of that going on than right now. So, and honestly, we're kind of, I think we're kind of fighting against a little bit at, on YouTube even because there's so much content around all that kind of stuff and money, honestly, being pumped into all the different social channels and ads and stuff like that, that, you know, we're just trying to talk about pens, yeah. you know? And it's like, there's a lot of just other noise out there that I think that it can honestly get, be harder for people to discover just like genuine little niche interests like this than there were maybe 10 years ago Yeah, because there's so much more of an industry around all this like posturing. YouTube is a very different place than it was 10 years ago. I mean, all social channels are, yeah. are, have changed quite a bit. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm kind of going a little bit cynical right off the bat, but I will say, you know, it's, it's so tough when you're young and uh, you're particularly young, but you don't have to be young uh, to kind of fall to some of those traps, but um, it can be so, so vulnerable to like want to get mentorship from somebody, especially who's written a book or has a seminar or whatever that you can kind of fall prey to things without quite realizing it. So I would say just anything you approach, use your life experiences, use your gut, use your instinct to kind of filter out any of that stuff. Uh, as a general rule, none of this like leadership stuff, there's no magic pill, just like anything, just like dieting, exercise, like nobody can get, you know, completely ripped like six pack abs with no steroids by eating like raw liver or whatever. Oh, you're talking about the like, liver king? I didn't say any names. <laughs> But I mean, like the number, of, the number of scams and stuff that are out there right now. And it's just like, you can't even keep up with it, Yeah, you know, for whatever thing, whether it's health related, whether it's like, you know, fake martial artists, whether it's crypto scams, whether it's, I mean, just it's everywhere. It really is. You know, chess cheating, all this kind of stuff. Like it's, it's all the, the biggest headlines and stuff that you see. Um, so the, the toughest thing, honestly, is just filtering through all that garbage to just find something that's like actually real. So, um, I mean, I think using your best judgment, digging in, looking at looking at resources of people that are trying to like unveil some of the the scammy type stuff. Just using your instinct, like if it seems too good to be true, it definitely is. That's exactly what like, I was gonna say. That still holds true. Absolutely, <laughs> that always holds true. But anyway, there's so there's tons of resources out there, and the reason you're asking this question, Adam, probably is because like we 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 make we make nothing from telling you any of this stuff. I mean, there's a fountain pen podcast and we're sitting here talking about leadership we gain nothing by even answering this question yeah so and, and we, we know that we're not selling what a you will. ton of pens by you know a two-hour podcast no. about pens well i mean <laughs> i mean hopefully it helps a little bit but we we do it because it's fun and entertaining yeah. and all that but the amount of time we spend talking to you yeah. about things you should buy from our website if you'll have noticed is it's very few minimal <laughs> on these ones yeah but we stand to gain nothing by telling you about these books other than like we just want to try to help you out so anyway I have a lot of books that I've read and there are a lot of them, honestly, a lot of them blur together yeah. over time because so many of them talk about some of the same things. Well, you've always told me if you can take away one or two principles out of a book, then, yeah. then you're, you're doing good. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, like I would read books and I would like, they would be like, oh my gosh, so much more revelatory because I, I had less of a basis of, of, of any experience or knowledge to pull from. So yeah, I'd read something and so much of it would be new to me. So some of the earlier books were very impactful. But then as I read more and more and more, I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, it's uh, kind of the same thing, right. you know, that's reinforced. There's, there's kind of some basic principles, which none of them are super relevatory. Um, so uh, some books I wanted to mention, at least some specific books this is by no means an exhaustive list. I just kind of sat down for a few minutes and thought about them. 
Um, uh, and it's in no particular order either. Um, but like Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that's a pretty tried and true one. Um, you can usually tell like what are the good books because there's a lot of other authors that kind of build upon it or reference it. A lot of the books that I've read, I've, when I find a book that I like really, re that really resonates with me and they mention principles that they get from other people, you know, it's like the right thing to do. You don't want to like cop copyright yeah. infringe yeah. and like steal somebody else's idea. But I think Stephen Covey, like, I've read the seven habits. I have a I couldn't tell you what two of the habits are because I can't remember them. And I also hate books with numbers, but they, they sell better, you know, and they, they break it down. And it's the same thing with us with making videos. It's like, ah, if we turn it into a number, like yeah. it's going to perform better. So we'll do that. You know, so I get it, but it's also like, it's a little, it's a little hokey. Um, but anyway, so, but the thing I really like that Stephen Covey did was the whole like, um, uh, matrix of, uh, like the quadrants. Um, so it's like the important and urgent. I didn't know that was him. That like, was him. I, I remember the concept, awesome. but I don't remember who it was. Okay. Yeah. 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 But that was, I, I think it was from like the eighties or something. It's like, so it's been a while. Everybody's referenced it. So basically you have, like, you have four quadrants, you have important and urgent. So like quadrant one would be things that are both important and urgent. So like, that's your highest priority stuff. And I forget what the actual matrix thing is called, but then I've seen it two different ways, whether it's like, quadrant two is important and not urgent. I think that's the way that I do it. So it's like, if it's important and not urgent, that would be like exercising, you know, general like health thing, reading leadership books, stuff that's good for you. Chang changing the fluids in your car. Yeah, you exactly. Know. Yeah, it's stuff that's good for you, but yeah. it doesn't have to be done today. Right. But it's like, if you let it go for a month or a year or whatever, then yeah, you're gonna have you know, problems. Um, quadrant three is stuff that urgent, but not important. There's a lot of that going on, most social media platforms probably would fall into that category. Things that like have your attention, but don't have any substance. And then quadrant four is not important, not urgent, spam email, I don't know, stuff like that, <laughs> junk mail, um, that would all fall into that category. So, you know, principles like that, uh, that's a Stephen Covey thing. So that's kind of helpful. Um, John Maxwell has, I think he's written like 90 books or something crazy like that. Um, and he packages some, some things up pretty well. A lot of his books probably talk about some of the same principles, but a couple of them, five levels of leadership was really good. Um, that was helpful, especially when talking about like an organization structure, um, as we were building our company and thinking about, um, you know, like permission leadership, which is like, you have a title or no, sorry, positional, I think is the first one where you have a title, but nothing else. You know, think about like an, you know, assistant manager at like a McDonald's or something. It's like, you know, you've been working there six weeks longer than somebody else. And now you're like a shift manager or something. It's title only. Um, then you have permission and then, you know, some other things. So that one's really good. He has another book that was 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, I think it was. I definitely don't remember what all 21 are, but the one that stuck out of me from that book is the idea of the leadership lid. Oh, right. You've mentioned that. So that's where that came from. And I actually got the leadership lid concept from a totally different book that referenced John Maxwell's thing. And I, truth be told, I don't even think I've read the whole 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership because it's like this thick. It's like 400 pages. And I'm like, that's too much. Um, so anyway, I've read the leadership lid one though, which is good, which yeah. basically says like your organization can never grow any more than your capacity to lead it. So it's sort of like it's that personal responsibility. Which basically means Brian honest. blames everything on himself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not literally everything, but it's like as a leader, whether you're a leader of your family, you know, your your small small group of friends or whatever it is, if you're like in that position of leadership, then ultimately it's your responsibility to deal yeah. with whatever's going on. I, I will say it is very refreshing being a part of a company where the owners uh, take as much responsibility as you guys do. Yeah, it's, it's, probably it's, too much, honestly. No, I would like, I would agree. Yeah, definitely, my therapist tells me definitely I, too I take much. on too much responsibility. No, one hundred percent. You definitely do, <laughs> but you also do acknowledge that you know you do have influence and set an example. Yeah, you know, yeah. to follow. So it's a it's a big deal. Not everybody in that position, you know, admits that. Well, it's that I don't know where the quote came from. It was like might even been Spider Man or something like with great power. Oh yeah, great responsibility. That's one hundred percent, Uncle Ben. Yeah. So I mean. I'm not sure that that's where it actually originated from, but maybe it was popularized. But no, it's true. Like if you have a if you have a, a position of like leadership, then yeah, every problem is yours to deal with, but you also have the ability to fix every problem that's there. So it's like if you accept that responsibility, you're like, oh, okay, I have to deal with it, but it's you know I can also solve it. So there's a big there's a big um, you know kind of shifting of the mind that has to happen when you when you step into that. Um, Dave Ramsey, some of his stuff, I'm like, okay, 
I'm not like totally drinking the Kool-Aid, but he, ha he has some pretty solid stuff. Um, uh, Entree Leadership, his book there has got a lot of pretty solid stuff that was uh, pretty formative for us coming on. The thing that I like from him that's probably stuck the most has been the five enemies of unity. Mm -hmm. um, that was particularly good. Um, I think that was in the Entree Leadership book, but he's yeah. got like a blog post on it and stuff too. So it basically talks about like the things that will de-unify a group, things like gossip, um, sanctioned incompetence, leadership failure, um, I don't remember the other two right off the top of my head, but uh, those Fail, are pretty Failure good. to communicate. Failure to communicate and then- And lack of shared lack purpose. Lack of shared purpose, yep. Yeah. So those things are all things that I keep in mind kind of yeah. to watch out for. Um, another one, this is not like a, a leadership specific, like I'm leading people, but Simon Sinek, um, he's, he's a good kind of thought leader uh, kind of guy. And he wrote a book called Start With Why. Mm -hmm. super, oh yeah. Super good. So it's more about like, um, your own kind of formation of an idea or like your own reasoning behind why you're doing something. So it's less on like leading people and more about like the purpose behind what you're doing. Um, and so that book is really good. And he's, I think since he wrote that book, he's written other like leaders eat last. He's written some other leadership specific books that are also very good. So Simon Sinek's stuff is really good. Um, so I recommend any of his books. Um, another one, this is not so much of a like, I'm leading people, but this is more of like an interrelational book. Um, it's called Boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud. Um, and Boundaries is important. I've found it to be very beneficial thing in just in my personal relationships, like family members, things like that, my kids. Um, but also, you know, in the workplace as well, I found it to be helpful. Um, but basically, you know, setting and, and proper boundaries in your personal life and respecting those. And, you know, personally, I, I because I have such a heavy sense of responsibility, I then, you know, may struggle with setting some boundaries and, you know, holding others responsible, following up, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so that's really good. I highly recommend that book. Um, Brene Brown, lot, she's got lots of good stuff, lots of good stuff. Um, but the first thing I ever discovered of hers was The Power of Vulnerability, which is like, to me, still the best thing that she's done. But she's done a lot of really great stuff. She has. So any of her stuff is pretty solid. Um, but yeah, big real big on like vulnerability and that comes into like boundaries and that kind of stuff. I don't stuff know if too. she actually publishes that specific book any longer. I think it's like an, it was like a- Like I tried to- A talk that she gave It was a talk, something. but there was a book and I don't think it's printed. I think she's kind of rolled that into another printing of Maybe, something else. Because yeah. I tried to buy it for my mom recently. Yeah, I bought like an audio book of it. Yeah. But it was so, like a live talk that she gave Yes, or yeah, I have that too. Yeah. Uh, but either way, like she talks a lot about vulnerability. So you can find the content out there, you know, repackaged yeah. in some- equally effective form, I'm sure. Yeah, so, you know, the all, all three of those maybe fall a little bit more in, I hate to say self-help, but a little more of like the personal development as opposed to, which being honest, like most leadership development is a lot of personal development. You, yeah, you should be you know, doing that, yeah. Yeah, there's probably a split, and I'm sure somebody in one of the books I've read has given a breakdown of <laughs> maybe how much time you should spend on like your own personal development, coaching and leading others, you know, like the financial aspects of your business and so on and so forth. But I would say the personal development is at least like 10, 15% probably of the, the time and the content you can consume. Um, then another good one is Essentialism by Greg McEwen. I've read this book several times. Um, talks a lot about, again, kind of fits into some of the boundaries territory a little bit, touches a little bit on some of the, start with why, like your purpose, that kind of a thing. Um, but that one, um, Oh, it's really, it's, it's really good. And the, uh, I'm failing to remember some of the details of exactly why I like it so much. That's why I keep rereading it. <laughs> um, There's something in here that I like. Definitely. And that's honestly, that's where most of these books fall sometimes. And some of them, it's been like a while. It might have been a decade since I've read some of these. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, oh, I remember the, the principles of that, but I, I don't remember exactly how it was phrased or which book it might've come out of. So I'll like go back and revisit some or re-listen re to some audio books. So like, I would say right now, I'm probably spending maybe two thirds of my time when I am listening to, to books, um, I'll spend two thirds of my time listening to new books maybe. And then a third of my time, maybe just like going back and re-listening to some books that I've already read before, just to kind of be reminded of them again, yeah. um, which is super easy. Because honestly, most, I found a lot of these books, a lot of it comes down to timing. You know, it's just like, are you in a place in your life where a, a book with a certain message might hit in a certain way? Yeah. You know, it's like you can, I've, I've had books that I've read three, four, five times, you know, that have all hit in a different way at different times just because of what's going on in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's where a good a good book will do that. And that's where you see the good books that have sold well for like 30, 40, 50 years. 
that's not just because of a marketing campaign. That's because there's like substance in that book. There's like longstanding like principles that are told really well in a specific way. Um, like how to win fl- friends and influence people. That that book is old. That book is a hundred years old. I yeah, think. yeah, super old. And it has plenty it. that is outdated. Sure. Plenty that reads really awkwardly just because of how dated it is. Sure. But it also has a plenty. It's got like, solid principles. You know, yeah, solid everlasting mm-hmm. principles to it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's good stuff to be had from a lot of those. So I would say, you know, I'm probably more into what I would consider to be some of the classics at this point, just because, you know, they've stood the test of time a little bit and, you know, others have had a chance to vet them a little bit more. And, and I'll usually take like recommendations from others that I know that are also reading these types of books and that know me, they'll make recommendations. And that's sort of a way that I can kind of filter through. And I'll do the same thing for others. I'll recommend things like that. Um, another good one I thought that was purely from a personal productivity standpoint is Getting Things Done by David Allen. Oh, yeah. Um, he's written several other books that are all in the same vein that are also helpful. Um, me personally, that's the most helpful productivity methodology or approach that I've ever found to be helpful for me. I mean, productivity is going to be totally different for every person based on your skills and, and what you're dealing with, but that was a super helpful one for me. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any others that come to mind, but that's all I got at the moment. Yeah. Who did the um, uh, ideal team player? Oh, yes, yes. Um, um, Patrick Lincioni. Because Lincioni, the, we, you mentioned... He had a lot of good... He has a lot of good stuff. Yeah, We've incorporated you, a lot of that. You mentioned having, you know, a story in the Leadership Principle books. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that his work really rings with me because mm-hmm. the first chunk of the book is usually a fable. Yeah. Um, he, like, so, he literally, like, makes up a story. Right. He makes up a story yeah. that using real-world scenarios, mm-hmm. like an HR manager gets hired to do something or a, mm-hmm. new, a partner gets brought on because of this big upcoming construction project. Project. Mm-hmm. Um, he works his principles into the story, and then in the second half of the book, actually explains the concepts and the principles there using the stuff that you already kind of have in your brain, mm-hmm. having listened to the story as examples. So that rather than it just being all philosophy and all principle, yeah. you now have this more experiential side of things to say, oh, that's what that pr- principle looks like, or that's what that philosophy looks like to me yeah. that helps a lot in retaining stuff in my brain yeah and he falls more into the he's more like the consultant who's worked with a lot of leaders and that his is less from like having built i mean he's built his own organization based on the coaching and stuff that he's done he has a lot of really solid kind of principles and there's there's definitely some thought leaders that are more in that camp i find benefit from others you know like a dave ramsey type and like the, has built a business and then wrote a book about the business that he built i find those to be helpful um uh, the other, uh, Patrick Lincioni has got several good ones. Yeah, Ideal Team Player is definitely a good one. Um, and we've incorporated quite a bit of that here. Uh, we've even read it to our team. And then we, um, um, QBQ is another good one. Mm-hmm. That's more of like a personal mentality one. Who moved my cheese? Oh, yeah. That's another good one. These all, are all, all three ones that the whole company has read, by the yeah, way. Yeah, and those are all pretty short. Previous versions of the company. Yeah, those are all pretty short ones. Um, but The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni, that's like his kind of capstone book. I think it was like the 10th book he wrote. It incorporates a lot of his other earlier books. Um, that's also kind of fable driven. So yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, for me, uh, Brene Brown first came to my mind because oh, yeah. uh, I never thought of myself as anybody who would manage or lead ever. I just don't have what I thought that quality was. Uh, When I got hired here, I absolutely saw Brian as a leader. He had what I had up to that point defined as leadership qualities, which I guess are more uh, classic leadership qualities. Somebody who is a driver, who is, you know, a a visionary, you know, someone that like sees and goes and grabs the brass ring. I'm Mm -hmm. not that person. I'm not. Uh, So I, when faced with an opportunity, Rachel and Brian were like, hey, how about you, you know, uh, think about you as the customer care leader. I'm like, ah, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, they're like, no, 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 it, it actually makes a lot of sense. I'm like, what are you talking about? That, that, that's <laughs> So what I remember you told me was that, you know, you're not going to be me. You are going to be your version of a right. leader. Yeah. And that was like, wait, what? There's only one version of a leader. And you're like, no, absolutely not true. No, definitely not. So one, yeah. once I got some, you know, good coaching from you and just oh, kind of had a paradigm shift where I kind of redefined what leadership meant in terms of my leadership, that just completely changed the game for me. Mm. And I would say that in anybody who is looking at stepping into a leadership role and thinks that they don't have what it takes or think that they can't, you know, uh, develop what it takes, uh, don't try to fit yourself into a different mold just because you don't think you 
are what you need to be. Just find out what leadership looks like using the qualities you possess. I found myself to be a way more engaging, empathetic, feeling type of leader rather mm -hmm. than a direct, you know, assignment based type of leader. I found that that's more where my strengths were aligned. And it works well for people that find that value valuable in a leader. It won't work well for all places, but you know, you can get a different job somewhere else. But if that's mm -hmm. what you want, find out what where your strengths lie, develop your own leadership, you know, profile for yourself and your strengths. And then either if you don't have that opportunity where you work now, find some place where that type and style of leadership is desired. Mm -hmm. So that's where the vulnerability thing worked for me because I was able to open myself up with, you know, suggestions from Brian, Brene Brown books, things like that and be honest, be approachable, and uh, truly empathize with you know your team and your direct reports. Uh, one thing that I liked to say was that if um, I was like uh, not comparing any sort of my leadership styles to being the driver of a vehicle or the pilot of a vehicle, rather saying that I was the mechanic of that vehicle and the team was driving and operating, mm -hmm. meaning I am maintaining you know, I am oiling, I am mm -hmm. repairing, making sure that the vehicle yeah. can just go. If you're mm -hmm. a leader and it is your responsibility to drive the vehicle, then if you're not there, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, what you should be doing is making sure that the vehicle that you have crafted and you have installed the right operators and pilots can go. And what you need to do is just optimize that vehicle, make sure everything is optimized. And that to me, was a much more attainable version of leadership mm -hmm. than that preconceived notion that I had Absolutely. in my own head. Yeah, there's a, there's another book that, as you were talking, I, I recalled. Um, it's called The E Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Um, he talks about a like about a lot about like systems and kind of like a franchise model of business, which is certainly an approach. Um, it's not the way that everything should be done, but um, but I really like that concept out of that book because he talked about basically there's three different types of business owners or leaders. Um, is the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. He says that the technician is somebody like, think of like a computer programmer who just doesn't want to be told what to do, wants to write code their own way or whatever. And so they start a business so that they can just do the work. Mm. They just don't want to deal with the boss. They don't want to deal with clients. They just want to do the work. Well, they struggle because there's a lot of things with running a business that's different than just doing the work. In fact, like now I would say I spend maybe 3% of my time doing the work mm -hmm. like I used to. And I spend all the rest of my time supporting our team, doing leadership, strategy, finance, like all that kind of stuff. Um, the manager is what you were talking about, Drew. It's like making sure that your people are taken care of, your good systems are in place, making sure that customers are taken care of, that you have, you know, well-crafted emails, that you have, you know, all the mechanics of how the things are operating. That's got to run smoothly. Well, you know, some people really thrive in that environment. Other people don't. They're not wired for that. Um, and then you've got the entrepreneur, which is more of like the visionary type, the driver, the one coming up with the crazy ideas, taking the risks, all that kind of stuff. And the thing is, you really kind of need all three covered in a business. Um, and then, you know, if you are too heavy on any one of those, or if you only have one of those as the founder of the business, you can you can have a lot of holes and that's where things can go kind of sideways. sometimes it's very <clears throat> difficult for the owner to step away from one of those three things oh yeah because you start off doing all of it well you try but yeah. you know <laughs> that's that's why a lot of businesses fail right because you don't and they can't make the handoff there's so many different areas to cover like yeah. there's so many different things you got to do when you start a business um but i mean not this isn't just about you know, starting your own business or whatever. It could be leadership in any capacity, but, you know, particularly if you have like a leadership team or whatever, you know, the decision makers, you need to make sure that these areas are kind of covered. Um, and then one last book that I'll mention is called Traction by Gina Wickman. So this is a little more of like a running a business type book, but it's super popular among like the e-commerce community and like other people that I know that run their own small businesses, especially very vibrant ones. So there's kind of a system put in there, but um, it sort of talks about the concepts like Michael Gerber does in the E-Myth where, um, he's got what he calls like a visionary and a, um, uh, what is the other term? Like the more of the support, like logistics. Oh, I can't remember. The, the, it starts with an I. Oh, my memory's failing me. The, ba, 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 ba. it'll come to me. But basically, you know, somebody's a visionary is like the dreamer, right? Mm -hmm. Think of like Walt Disney. He was the dreamer. But he almost bankrupted the company so many times. So because, I had Roy. Yeah, Roy, his brother, like, you talk about like a leader, like most people don't even know Roy's name. Right. 
But like Disney would not be a fraction of, it wouldn't even be around anymore without Roy. Right. Like Roy is the one that made the business happen. Walt was a dreamer, Roy was the businessman. So like those are super important parts of both of it. Um, implementer, that's the word. Ah, there we go. Yeah, yep. that's Roy. Roy and he kept it going after Walt died. Yep. Roy helped usher it into, you know, version two. Absolutely, two. absolutely. And you find that dynamic, you know, you know, in me and in, in this business example, Rachel falls into more of that implementer camp. Yes. Whereas I was more of the, the visionary, the dreamer. So, you know, these are all important things and there's no one way to do any of this stuff. Right. There's a lot of different leadership styles. Who did um, Good to Great? That was uh, Jim Collins. So that That's one, pretty solid one, that yeah. one stuck out with me because there was one mm -hmm. principle where he talked about, he defines what level five leaders are. Mm -hmm. And that I'll never forget because mm -hmm. he defined level four leaders as those big, loud, brash leaders who yeah. get things done for sure, but leave a little bit of a mm -hmm. path of destruction in their wake. They don't really yeah. concern yeah. themselves as much with how the business or the team does when yeah. they're gone. They don't set up any legacy. Right. Whereas, in fact, in fact, they'll usually set up where it will fail after they're exactly. gone to prove how great they were as the leader. Exactly. But they're the ones that get the most attention. And that yeah. stuck with me because in this day and age, mm -hmm. for sure, and t going back to what you said about how some books hit differently during the time, for sure. these days, it's so painfully obvious that advancement sometimes gets heavily influenced by how many heads someone else steps on to reach that point or mm -hmm. how loud they are or how many people they can just get riled up to their cause. Mm -hmm. Where in this book, in the Jim Collins Good to Great book, he mentions level five leaders are the types of leaders you will find where you look for where excellence is happening but no one is jumping up to take credit for yeah, it. Yeah, you can't see any obvious like person. You're like, how is this actually happening? That means that there's somebody there that's just doing the work, being awesome, being excellent, that isn't seeking more than they deserve. And that's the type of people you need to promote. Those are the type mm -hmm. of leaders that will last. They're the type of leaders that will care about the legacy of the company mm -hmm. when they're gone. They will put redundancies into play. Mm -hmm. They will make sure that it's set up for success even when they depart. And those are rarer and rarer. And even mm -hmm. and now, more so when I first read the book, does that seem like, oh my gosh, where in the world are these level five leaders? And they don't get a lot of attention no, either. because they, they don't, don't want it. They don't seek it. Yeah, they, they don't, don't seek it. it. All they want is to be good at what they do and they want to build something that's going to outlive them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that one stuck with me a lot. I love that. Yeah. And kind of, I think it was from that, that level four, level five thing you're talking about. Um, one metaphor that stuck with me is the idea of the window versus the mirror. Yes. So like a level four leader, you know, one who looks at themselves as being so great, they look at it as a, as a window. So like when they see a bunch of problems or whatever, they're like, oh, look at all these external things that are happening or all these people that are failing or whatever. Whereas a level five leader thinks of it as a mirror and they're like, oh, I'm the one that can address these problems. I'm right. the one who needs to fix these things. It's the, that, that personal responsibility of like looking back at yourself versus blaming others. Exactly. Another way to put that would be to say, you know, a level five leader looks out the window to give credit and mm -hmm. in the mirror to place blame. Yeah. And the opposite, you know, a level four would be like out the window to place blame in the mirror to give credit. Yeah. And and you, can, you can see that based on how, you know, when, when somebody gets praise for whatever reason, are they like puffing themselves You're up? Like, ah, like, yes, I did that? do that. <laughs> or like, you know, you, you can see this a lot too. Like if, if, if somebody's had a really, grown something really crazy, really successful, and they're getting a lot of credit and they're like, well, you know, the timing was right. I got really lucky. You know, there was, I had a great team. Those are all things that like a little right. more level five leader exactly. would talk about versus somebody else just talking about how great they mm -hmm. are. So I strive to be a level five. But I'm probably more like a three and a half. <laughs> but I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> cool. Well, good question, Drew. We did talk about it pretty well. There we go. Pretty thoroughly. Um, but let's talk about some more pen stuff again, shall we? Yes, indeed. So this is from Nav Nitsuj. Uh, asked, sometimes my standard international converters are too loose and fall out. What can I do? Well, first things first, as we have mentioned, Standard International doesn't really <laughs> it's more, mean standard. It's more standard than most other converters. Sure, it's not proprietary. It, standard International should just mean not proprietary. Yeah. Not necessarily standard, but it's not a pilot converter that can only fit pilot. It's more of like a somewhat standard. Standard-ish. Standard-ish. <laughs> standard international. So <laughs> our, what we define as a standard international converter as for sale on our website is the commonly referred to Schmidt K5. Is that what they call it? 
I think that's the um, standard one. I think it's K5, yeah. yeah. So that that's usually what you'll find you, if like it's a picture perfect standard international converter. Yeah. However, you'll also see third party, fourth party, hundredth party, party yeah, yeah, um, yeah. versions that have the same opening, the same diameter opening approximately as that, but might be shaped differently. You'll see mm -hmm. a, a Jin Hao has like five different converters they that are all, bunch, yeah. you know, and you know, you'll see some in Yaffa pens as well. They mix theirs up. It's a bit all over the place. Mm -hmm. So take, for example, the, um, what is it? I think the, uh, the Monteverde, no, sorry, the, uh, the Ritma, that's Monteverde Ritma, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah so that pen comes with a standard international converter. It's a bit floppy. You know, it's a bit, a little wobbly. Bit in there, yeah. It fits, it works just fine. But if you over, if, if you're tightening it, you know, bringing the piston rod back a little bit, uh, if you don't stop right there at the end and you keep twisting until it's like nice and tight, it'll just, it can pop it'll off. just pop right off. I mean, yeah. it can work just fine. But replacing mm -hmm. that with the standard international converter, Schmidt K5, um, changes the game. It makes it a much, much more reliable mm -hmm. filling experience for you mm -hmm. and a lot less tricky to deal with as well. So if you're experiencing a funky fit, my suggestion to you would just be to buy a standard international converter. Again, I'll link below so you can see exactly the converter I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. We don't call it the Schmidt K5 um, because for simplicity's sake, you know, a standard international converter, you know, we're gonna yeah. define it as that. But uh, that would be my suggestion, just to buy a regular old standard international converter. How many times am I gonna say that? Standard international converter, I'm <laughs> just gonna start being lazy about it and see if your situation improves. Odds are it will. Second thing I will say, is that with some of these other standard international converters, you just need to cram those things in like hard. Mm -hmm. Some of them feel like they're fitting in, but then you give them a real shove and you'll hear like a audible pop where mm -hmm. they actually go in. Mm -hmm. So your converter might not be in all the way. That might lead to that could very well be. how the issue is. And then if you are if you happen to be using a Pelican Twist, that has a whole nother, whole other- any, uh, of the, any of the like, you know, Intra, in, entry level pelicans, the Pelicano, yeah. the Pelicano Junior. Those they all pens, suffered. for some reason, are meant to have the barrel hold the converter mm -hmm. in place rather than the grip section. So that mm -hmm. is just confusing because how would you know that? You're going to insert it into the grip section and be like, this is floppy and terrible. What in the world? But then once you have the yeah. barrel on, on the twist and the Pelicano. Well, and like those pens, they're basically sold as cartridge pens. Yeah. So they can, a converter will fit in them. But they are, that's probably a total afterthought. Afterthought, yeah. Most you know. European countries are predominantly cartridge, yeah. you know, focused. Yeah. So it is, it's different with every brand and, you know, your mileage will vary plenty across these different brands, different converters, things like that. Yeah. So overall, but, I would say yeah. push harder if you're not already doing it. And if that doesn't work, buy a standard international converter. Yeah. Now, you know, there is another situation where you could have one that is fit fine, but maybe the converter has just gotten well used, well loved over time, doesn't fit quite as tight anymore. You know, the nice thing is most converters are relatively affordable. Mm -hmm. Even on the expensive end, some of them can bet, get to be like $10, $15. Yeah, that is a bit pricey for some of these, but it's not the end of the world. It's not like you gotta get a whole new pen. So for those that, if you have a pen where it used to fit really well and it just doesn't fit as well anymore, it could just be because, you know, these, these converters are essentially made to be replaced or replace a bowl. So it could just be that after using it so many times, yeah, it's maybe just worn out a little bit and replacing it would, would be beneficial. I don't really know of a good way to like revive a converter that's lost its holding ability. Um, but if you're like, if it still writes well, it's not like so loose in there that's like falling off or leaking air through it and dribbling ink onto your page. You know, it just isn't holding the grip on as tight anymore, but you can still use the converter. Then, you know, you don't have to buy anything necessarily. Um, you can just fill the converter directly from the bottle and then put it on the pen, sort of like a self-filling cartridge almost, and get some more life out of it. Um, if you happen to have an ink syringe or if you want to get one, you can refill the converter just directly with a syringe or you can refill maybe some spare cartridges, maybe even get additional ink capacity with refilling cartridges like Drew often talks about with the pilot. pilot yeah. um, so there could be alternatives, you know, as well to maybe just filling that particular pen slightly differently if you don't feel like, you know, buying a whole new converter and dealing with it. So you got other options as well, but I don't really know of a good way to like bring life back to the converter. You know, it's- I've heard some very tricky things of people actually seating it on the post and then using heat to kind of 
like yeah and that, that, that to is, me is risky you absolutely can, not you risk damaging the feed and then you can't really all sorts come back of from that problems can go wrong with that it's just not worth it for like a what six dollar converter not worth it international at all. No. international so i wouldn't do that necessarily but you're free to try i have not heard know. it ending well in most cases mm -hmm. all right our final cool. all right question back, back off pens now <laughs> yes uh <laughs> returning to us once again is hill re and lots of, lots of underscores. We there. get a question <laughs> that reads Did okay. you go directly from garage to warehouse or mm. did you expand in incremental steps? Well, today I left my garage to come outside and then I drove, I guess I drove to the front office. So, so directly from garage to warehouse? To warehouse. Well, to, to, well, to office. To office. To office. Okay. Then to warehouse. I'm sure so. that's exactly what Hilt <laughs> Ari is asking. But I did take some incremental steps to get up to our front door. Look at that. So a little bit of both. Office. So yes, I did take some incremental steps. Uh, no, I'm just being dumb. So uh, yeah, incremental steps all the way. I mean, so Rachel and I, we started this thing in our house. And I mean, the garage was like an iteration, even not, you know, we didn't start in the garage. Either. That's right. Started on an apartment balcony, turning pens. We then moved to a rental house where I worked in the garage, but we also did some stuff in like our dining room. Uh, and then we got our house, first house that we bought, which is where we like started the company in its modern form, uh, where primarily, I mean, I was making pens in our garage. We had a detached two car garage, about 500 square feet. So that was basically a, sh a workshop, but we weren't like, it wasn't a warehouse per se. Um, we had our dining room where we would pack orders. We worked on laptops watching our infant. So that was in our living room and uh, we had bookshelves in like the dining room and hallway. So it was just like all up in our house. And that was just practicality. We had a, we had an infant, so we couldn't just be gone. We had to be around. The videos in the, in uh, and, upstairs with your photo, uh, equipment yep, in the bedroom. In our bedroom. Yep. So we just worked wherever we could. Um, and then as it started to grow, I then compressed my workshop into half the garage. Oh, built a wall. fancy. So it was iterative even getting into the garage. So we took over half the garage while still doing some stuff inside the house and all that. And then we took over the whole garage. I got a shed, put all the crap in the shed from the garage and took the whole garage over into what really felt like an actual warehouse. And that's when Drew came into the picture. Yep. You saw that iteration. I remember going out in the shed to get boxes. Oh yeah, we would store boxes. We stored boxes either in the shed or in our upstairs, like in our guest room. Um, basically wherever we had space. And it bubble wrap like, up in the rafters. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, we would have to use a, a PVC pipe with a screw in it to like get the bubble wrap off. We called it our advanced technology. Nothing but the best. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we did whatever we had to do. And it got to the point where, I mean, you were there, Drew. We it had was, like five people. We crammed every square inch of that garage space full of people and products. Oh, I remember. I mean, you remember every new purchase order we get, if we added a new SKU of products, it's like, oh, Drew's going to spend the next two hours rearranging this bookshelf because we have to like... Tetris puzzle fit. I remember, yeah. The products onto these shelves. Pilot and so uh, inefficient. Pilot and Schaefer at the time were the yep. bane of my existence. I remember that. They were stacked like Every, they, yep. we had those shelves where there was a little bit of a lip at the edge of the shelf. But if you got past the lip, you could go one box higher. That's right. But you couldn't get it out. Yeah, because they were like they were like metal shelves. It's like the, no, I'm talking about the plastic uh, Home Depot shelves. Oh yeah, yeah. Those plastic, those yeah. had a little bit of a lip in them, so you mm -hmm. could you could go one up. But that means to get to that top layer, you need to take out a bottom mm -hmm. layer to act. You know, it was just, yeah. It was packed. Yeah. Packed. So it's like a, it's like one of those like soda can kind of dispensers where it's oh, like yeah. a whole soda container. Except thing. highly less effective. Yeah. So you'd have to like push everything out and grab one and push it all back. It was, so it was space efficient, but it was not time efficient. So it reached a point where it was like, I mean, it was very difficult for us to make that choice because we had no money in the beginning. So it was like, well, we had no options. We have to make it work in the space we have. But it got to the point where it was like, no, like legally we can't have this many people operating out of our house. And we, our hand was sort of forced. Um, so that's when we got a commercial space. Uh, and once we got the commercial space, we were like, okay, this makes way more sense. Like for what it cost us to get a commercial space at that time, it was so much more efficient. Well, we basically filled us. it up. We're like, how in the world did we have all this stuff in a garage? It's like, we already filled up this place yeah, immediately. We, we, when we saw the space empty, cause we had, we, had, we were operating in 500 square feet in the garage. But we were also taking up room in the shed and the dining room and the, all these yeah. other places in our yeah. house. It was basically it took over our life. Yeah. And then once we moved to a 3,000 square foot space, it was like, this is so huge. How in the world are we ever going to fill all this up? Well, we moved in and it was full. Yeah. When, once I wasn't shooting videos, not in my bedroom anymore, 
it's like, oh, well, there's a room with a space and some things, and, you know, so it's like, and we spread things out. It was like, oh, we can have like room on the shelf for like, when we add a new skew, we don't have to rearrange the entire shelf. You know, so we had some extra space on the shelves. And not a like, ton of extra space though. Like we didn't have we, we didn't have much. we didn't have one shelving unit that was empty. That's true. Yeah, we did we did space it out pretty good. Yeah. But then um I think it was like six months later, we then had, you know, we were in like a a, a building that had several different tenants in it. Yeah. Um and the whole building I wanna say was like twenty thousand square feet or something like that. We only had like a three thousand square foot suite with well, no warehouse. With, this was just all yeah. It was technically all space. it was all office space. All carpeted had, office space. It had a little. It had like a five hundred square foot area in the back that wasn't quite finished. It was more like a garage type thing, mm -hmm. and that's where we stored like boxes and things like that. Um, so there was that, but you know, basically it was it was kind of like a, everything was in a drop ceiling office, not unlike what we have now. Um, but then we had a tenant on the end of the building who they had twice the space we had. They were looking to downsize. We were looking to maybe upsize. And we worked it out with our landlord where we could swap and give us pretty favorable deal to do that. So that worked out nicely. But then as we grew- That one had a legit warehouse. That was our first time. That was when we yeah. started putting our products actually in a warehouse. Yeah. No yeah. climate control back then. No climate control, which was unfortunate. Um, but then basically we expanded into the next suite over, which was another 3,000 square feet. And then the next suite over back to the original suite we had, but it was actually three different addresses. It was three different utility bills. They were not connected everything. either. No. We not to, connected in any way. We had to do construction to like punch through and they were actually at different levels. So we had a It was all a downward slide. slope. Every yeah. every building was one <laughs> floor beneath. Wait, no, not every, all of them. Every 6,000 square feet was one step down. So yeah. we ended up with essentially a 12,000 square foot space that was split like three foot difference. Yeah. So we had to go up and down stairs if you went you know, from one side of the building to the other where we ended up storing all the products and then packing all the products was different levels. So we couldn't use carts, we couldn't do any of that. We had to slide basically orders in bins like down this homemade slide. Every single order that went, it, it, was, a, it was a bit wonky and then it wasn't climate controlled or any of that. So it was quite uncomfortable for our, our pulling team. Uh, so, you know, over time as we, we, we maxed out, we expanded there, we were there for like four, four and a half years. Yeah, but you can imagine that with three completely different locations that just introduced a whole host of uh, logistical issues. Like there mm -hmm. was no flow to our fulfillment yeah. process. Like they would, the orders would get printed here, but then they needed to go all the way over here so that the pulling process oh could begin. But then that needed to end over on the other side of the building. And it was like a lab. We had like multiple kitchens, it bathrooms was. everywhere. Yeah. And because they weren't, it wasn't meant to flow between no. three, three buildings at all. It ended up being where we had like three different sets of bathrooms, but it was like a bathroom made for one person. Yeah. So it's like, if you had to go to the bathroom and somebody was in there, you'd be like, okay, let me go to the other bathroom. Go you up know, the stairs, you'd, open you'd, another door. It was yeah. just like, you know, people would come and visit and we'd give them a tour and they would get, get lost. And it was like a maze. There was no, you couldn't do like a circuit to do a tour. You needed to create like some odd <laughs> hieroglyph in it's, order it pretty, to. It was pretty weird. It was pretty weird, you know. Um, so basically once we, once we sort of outgrew that space, we started looking around other spaces. We found our current space, which is, was twice that size. So it's about 24,000 square feet now which is plenty where we have not outgrown the no, space. Oh gosh, not even close. Especially since COVID, you know, we've gone a lot more hybrid for some folks. Mm -hmm. So now we don't need like as many dedicated offices and stuff. We've got, you know, the warehouse is filled up pretty nicely, you know, that, but uh, we still got some room there. They so. just, they just expanded and freed up a lot of space back there. Yeah. Yeah. So we're still focusing on efficiency and stuff, but essentially like the whole concept is, especially if you're starting a business from nothing, don't get any more space than you absolutely need. Um, now all of this takes into account, like, where you live. Like if you live in a very populated, very expensive area, you should maximize every square inch of that space because it's going to be so much more expensive for you to expand. If you live in a more rural area and you got all kinds of space, get the space. Like because per square foot, it's not going to cost you that much. And you can have so much more efficiency to a point when you have a little bit more space. So it's always going to be a balance between how much money do you have? What kind of like lease terms are you committing to? You know, the, I, I've found that when you have smaller spaces, you usually only need like maybe a three-year lease uh, for a commercial space. Whereas when you get to some of the bigger spaces, they may want five, eight, 10-year lease commitments. And those get obviously much more of a commitment. When if you have a larger business and you're more established and you don't want to be moving constantly, sure, that, that might make sense. But it's still, it's a much larger commitment. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to staying, um, you know, more efficient, staying smaller, staying leaner, especially in the beginning when there's a lot of unknown variables, you're changing, you're growing a lot. 
once you get bigger and more stable, then it's okay to maybe commit to a slightly larger space, maybe be a little less efficient in terms of your storage space, but more efficient in terms of your workflow and operations. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at right now. But, uh, you know, we've got two, two and a half years left on our current lease. That's so, so crazy. That's that's about the time frame where we started looking for this space when we were at our old one. So I'm, it's on my mind, believe me. It's, it's I've a already like to talked to our so, broker so and I'm like, we hey, been what's in, going on in the area? Have we been in this space longer than we've been in any other space? Yeah, we've been here five and a half years now. That blows my mind. Isn't that crazy? It feels like we were in those older awkward spaces so much longer. Yeah, we were, we moved in, That we, we technically started the lease like May of 2017, but we moved in like August 2017. That's when it all started. Yeah, isn't that wild? That is wild. So yeah, but yeah, I've got lease stuff on my mind right now and I'm like talking to our broker and looking Yay. around the area, which there's a lot of stuff in real estate. The interest rates going up have definitely like changed the conversation yeah. since I started talking to it our was broker not, like It was not an ago. easy task to move in here because Rachel and Brian did a lot for <sighs> this building. It was, it was basically just an empty shell. They focused on getting new carpet, new LED lighting, Great climate control in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. You're talking, you know, white noise machine, great network uh, response, wonderful mm -hmm. Wi Fi, yeah. it was, it, relaxation areas, a huge kitchen, tons of amenities, great bathrooms, new paint in the bathrooms, new toilets, all this stuff. Like they did a ton. So now, I've heard Brian mention the lease being up around Rachel's Rachel presence. Like, Rachel, Rachel like nothing to do. Don't even it. talk to any change around her. Don't even think about it. It's like Brian's like, hmm, you know what? We do have some options. Rachel's like, don't, don't. don't. This is the this is the visionary and the uh, <laughs> implementer. You know, she's about at, at melts. Here. Yeah, this is, yeah. This is a dynamic that Rachel so Brian, and I Brian's tend having to, have. to keep any kind of hmm, curiosities well, to I, himself like, right now. I think I think you know, top down like white space, and then right. bring it down out of the clouds rachel thinks like bottom up you yeah know? so she's like poking holes in things she yes. thinks details first so we're a great team together yes but if i don't watch myself i can stress her out a lot we're just like <laughs> throwing out large half-formed ideas and then she is just like poking holes in it and oh, getting yes. all frustrated and then i'm all frustrated i'm like why are you killing my dreams right? we haven't even like talked about it yet <laughs> i was just thinking just hear me out just you know idea. Oh, so man. yeah, but it's it's a fun dynamic. Yeah, but, for sure. Yeah. Anyway, so it's fun, but yeah, it's uh, there you go. Yeah, it's probably about all I want to talk about about that. All right. All right, but we do have a pen to talk about, don't we? We do. Drew? All right, so let's move on to our pen spotlight with the pilot Viplis. Do you want me to hand model, or we can trade off whatever? I don't know. You can hand model. This is how the sausage is made, folks. Yeah. All, all right. right. Here we go. Pilot. 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 Okay, there you go. Got some stuff in the bottom. Cartridge cap and uh, cartridge. Do you use a cartridge cap? No. I usually don't. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. Okay, here we go. VPLS. So the LS. Do, do we know what LS stands for? It stands for luxury specialness. Oh, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> um, I don't actually know what it stands for, but I think it's just kind of in the vein of like when you have a car that's like an LS, oh, like yeah. it's fancier. Um, it probably stands for like luxury something. I don't know. Uh, limited special. I don't know. Um, so its form factor is very similar to a regular vanishing point. Uh, it's got a clicky on the back. But what's cool is when you do the clicky thing. Look at that. It's a very soft click. So one, one thing that maybe I'm not as crazy about with a regular vanishing point, the click is pretty pronounced. It is very loud. Like if you're in a meeting and you're a fidgeter like me and you're clicking that thing, you're going to annoy some folks. This is a fidgeter's dream because it, really is. it doesn't make a lot of noise and the tactile feel of it is tremendous. You know, um, so you can click it again, but it doesn't actually undo it. Right. You just gotta kind of move it like that and it does like a soft I love the way that soft does. close. Yes. So this is a, a proprietary mechanism that Pilot developed a while ago. Um, and they just put it into this pen. They developed it for uh, another company, which I won't say who for legal reasons, but I think they still might have some kind of agreement with them. But anyway, it was a luxury brand that you all probably don't care about. But anyway, so it's a it's it's basically a vanishing point, right? So it's like a it's not a, a life changing difference of a pen, but this mechanism is by far the coolest part of the whole pen. Yeah, I so. like to I like to hold it um and give this just like one flick of the thumb. Yeah, you just have to like, like oh, do that man. and it just yeah. undoes. Yeah. So it's just Boom. Yeah. I love that so much. 
Yeah, and it's like, you know, it's it's kind of like having a luxury car versus a regular car. Like for the up, up it's what, like almost twice the price of a regular Vanishing Point. It's the same guts of the pen. Like yeah, performance is going to be the same. It's going to be the same. So it's just some of these other little niceties. Um, the center band, I like. It's sort of streamlined a little bit. The center band on the uh, colored know. one looks uh, quite different too. Yeah. So that one's a lot more blingy. Yeah. So it's got like a, I don't know, to me it almost looks like a like a bird grinder or something. Oh, it kind of does. Right? Yeah. So definitely got some bling to it. Yeah. I love it though. It's it's really cool. I like and this, it, it, I like it, this it, color a lot yeah, too. Yeah, it's a very beautiful burgundy. So same kind of deal. The other ones all have rhodium trim. Now, does that one have a little red line on the end of the uh, little switchy do? Um, I don't think so. It's got black. Black. Okay, so that's one difference too. Yeah, I think the, I think the black one is the only one that's got the red line. Yep. Um, and then the black is all black and doesn't have the burr grinder mm-hmm. center band. Um, but yeah, I mean. The pen itself, you know, uses all the same vanishing point nibs. You take it apart just like a vanishing point. You can take out the converter and use cartridges with it. So the operation of it is very similar to a vanishing point if you're familiar with that at all. Um, it's basically just like a slightly nicer, more luxurious version of a vanishing point. Now, the weird thing was when this pen first came out, it was on the market for a hot second mm-hmm. and then got taken off of the market it because did. Pilot wanted to rework some of the internals. Yeah, I think, you know, and they're not trying to like hide anything about this. In fact, I give them a lot of credit because I think there were some internal parts of the mechanism that they thought would have the potential to rust or degrade faster than what they wanted. Uh, So they essentially kind of recalled them. And, um, you know, if you, you know, I'm not sure where it stands now because we didn't really sell a lot of them to begin with. No, it was really fast. Um, They took it out pretty pretty quickly. But if you have one, an original one that you bought maybe in the first like four months or so that they came out, um, you know, reach out to us and we can can try and get it taken care of. Which was what, like 2019? Yeah, it was all during that COVID stuff that my memory is pretty hazy. Yeah. So it was I think like, it was before COVID. It might. I think it was announced before COVID. I don't think. I don't know if they were delivered. No, it was definitely before COVID because we included this in the uh, uh, satisfying moments video. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So I it think was like, it was. They didn't like. They they stopped it and then they didn't come out with a new version until I don't anyway. Yeah. So anyway, all the ones we have now are all the newer version mm-hmm. and they're all good. So yeah, but it's it's. You know, I don't know. Is it like any different? I feel like the the front section is a little shorter than a vanishing point too, right? Because normally the vanishing point, yeah, like the clip, the cone is yeah. more elongated. Yeah. So even just like visually, you're seeing more of like the color. Yeah. You know, so there's there's also a bit... the clip is set into the cone in the other vanishing points. Yeah. Yeah. So the cone like is is much longer on yeah. a regular vanishing point. On this one, point the here. clip is set into the barrel. And I, f- I feel like the clip is a little thinner. It's a little more streamlined. There's all these like little differences mm-hmm. on this one uh, aesthetically that uh, are different. But I mean, yeah, you can. It's like stealth. Yeah. That mechanism is fantastic. That's cool. I mean, this is really, this is really where, where it all comes from is, is this little, this little uh, thing. Yeah, and it's just like so easy to. And it's quiet. I do it like that. Quiet. Yeah, so pretty cool. It's definitely more of a luxury product, um, but uh, not a huge seller for us. You know, a little bit more specific of a thing, but um, wanted to give it a little bit of love because I think it just lost some. It did lose some steam. Lost some yeah. momentum. Yeah, mm-hmm. with the original release and then um, them fixing that. But you know, to Pilot's credit, they wanted to make it right. They wanted to make a better product, and uh, I think they did. So there you go. There we go. That is the Vanishing Point LS. From Pilot. That's a really fun pen to use. Yeah, I agree. Definitely, if you love a vanishing point, you're like, ah, I want, I want to, I want to upgrade. I want a newer, nicer, fancier pen, but I really don't I want, use I want, anything but yeah. my vanishing point. This is just another color of this vanishing is point. this is like the vanishing point 2.0. Mm-hmm. There you go. You know, and if you want the whole family, you can do Decimo, Capless, and then the LS. Yep. Get the whole mixture. That's I've right. Got a printed collection of plenty of all of them going on in my world. I, I feel like if I were to buy an LS, I would probably not buy a black mat. As much as I love the black mat, yeah. I'm really in love with the trim and the detail of the ones with the, uh, I, the rhodium trim. I, I ended up taking a black mat for myself. I mean, that, I was so torn by that. I have a black mat to uh, a vanishing point. Mm-hmm. Um, Which but, is like classic. I mean, yeah, that's the and I'm glad I do. I wouldn't trade it, but yeah. I like the blue and the burgundy mm-hmm. LS. 
That burgundy one looks really good. I know. I've not actually seen this since we launched it. Want, yeah. Like that is a good looking pen. I'm trying to remember like if that color is any different than it was originally. Right. It seems so much more cool now. I know. I kind of like it. <laughs> I kind of want to trade my black one. What happened? But I don't know. We'll see. But hey, cool pen. Go check it out if you're interested. Very cool. Yeah, you can write one off. Be like, Rachel, I was going to write off one of those Pelican Machias, but I chose not to. There and I go. did this instead. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And she'll be like, wow, Does Brian, what restraint. That'll what work. admirable yeah, she'll restraint. Be, she'll be so proud of me. You have. I have a story about restraint that I'll get to oh. in our next segment. Does it involve chocolate? Big segue. No. <laughs> okay. It involves wood. Okay. Uh, but we'll get to that. I had a 50 50 shot, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we'll get there. Uh, but that's a good segue onto our what's happening. The nonsense, like more, more nonsensical than the rest of it portion of our thing. There we go. <laughs> All right. So I have to mention this because in the last pencast, I mentioned that I was destined for a friend's birthday party, which was going to be a murder mystery dinner party yes wherein we were all not only going to be dressing up as our characters for the murder mystery because yeah. you buy a package and it assigns you different characters assigns a story assigns okay. these little clue packets that then you hand out to everybody that mm -hmm. include things that only they know things that they need to go and ask other characters in addition to all that my friend josh wanted us all to dress up as these characters as though velma from scooby-doo was dressing up as them. So it's like a layer on top of these characters. Completely unnecessary, has yeah. no bearing on the story or the evening. He just, just wanted to see everybody in bob wigs and orange tops and red bottoms. I okay. it's it was sadistic, really. Okay. So I'm like I'm not going to wear a wig. I'm like I'm buying red pants for you. I'm buying an orange turtleneck for you. I don't need to buy an or a, a wig. Uh, so Fair enough. Fair enough. <sighs> but it ended up everybody there was about you know, at least five dudes in drag, you know, because that needed to happen. I think that was, his, he's a huge fan of like RuPaul's Drag Race. So I think okay. that he really just wanted to secretly get a bunch of dudes in drag. So anyway, it happened. Everybody was dressed up as a version of Velma. It was a weird, crazy fun <laughs> night. Um, but uh, I will say that uh, I was not the murderer. Um, no one guessed the murderer, by the way. So I don't know what oh. the heck happened there. Okay. But there were, there was an award for um, best dressed, um, the Drama Queen Award, and then award for the, uh, he just personally gave out another award for the best rendition of Velma, which did mm. not have a certificate. But uh, mm. last year, my wife, Shannon, got the Drama Queen Award because mm -hmm. she was the wife of the murdered victim. And so she was just really, like, oh my God. And yeah. Anytime someone would come up to be like, and ask her about like her alibi or something, she would just fly off the handle and accuse that person of being the murderer. And it was like, okay, so no, no, no. I, I, I'm Classic the deflection. Oh, yeah. yeah, she was. And she ended up being the murderer. Mm -hmm. So. She ended up uh, getting the Drama Queen Award last year. We've had it on the side of the refrigerator. Uh, this year. Are you the Drama Queen this year? I got the Drama Queen Award wow. this year. So okay. um, I was an attorney and it was my job to convince everybody at the party that the district attorney was not suited for his job and oh. because I wanted the DA's position. Of course. So I was going around being like, hey, this guy, you know, right here. And, you know, you had some fake money. You're paying people off. I was accepting donations for my campaign. Um, so I just did that. Uh, wasn't like super bombastic about it or anything, but apparently enough people thought that I, because uh, it was, they took a vote at the end. So enough people okay. thought that I was the most in character wow. person, which is crazy because I'm one of the more introverted people of that group. So, uh, but yeah. I even wow. got a crown. Wow. Yeah, drama queen. Okay. Right here. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, it, I, I had not. Was Shannon jealous? Oh, uh, I think she was. Was she gunning for a drama no, queen? No, probably. She hasn't spoken to me since. Oh, gosh. That's no. rough. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. No, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fun night. So, yeah, I'll throw a picture up because it's nothing you will have ever have seen before. I did see some pictures on Instagram and I was like, wow, this is exactly as you described. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Yep. It's they're Wow. They're, they're irreplaceable friends. So yeah, I would say so. That's Love cool. Them. <laughs> um, and then uh, watch some movies recently. Shannon yeah? and I watched okay. the new Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick. Didn't you see that before? I mean, you I saw, saw it in the theater, theater right? Yep. Yeah. And then uh, it's, you with your dad and your brother. And I did. Yeah, it was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's I on, it's on, uh, seen it, yeah. Did you I've seen. see the original? I've seen the original. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, it's on uh, Paramount Plus right now. So I don't oh, know if you okay. have Oh, uh, I don't think I have Paramount. Mm. Is, that where, is that the one that has Sonic the Hedgehog on it? 
I don't know. I don't know. My kids watch the Sonic movie like we, over and over we, again. we I have think that a, might be Paramount. We Plus. have a friend's password, but uh, <gasps> I'm going to out my wife right now. People do that? Because, uh, Shocking. My wife uses Paramount Plus to watch all of her trash TV oh. because she has like garbage TV on while she's working because she works from home, but she has like some stuff going on just kind of in the background, but she's like okay. watches the whole like 90 day fiance and like all oh, like stuff, yeah. married at first sight or something like all like the stuff that she's like totally wouldn't want me mentioning but uh like my super sweet 16 like that i don't know if she's done that one but she's like i don't i've, it's, I've guilty watched she's like, she's like it's just on the background there. i'm not committed to it it's just there yeah yeah, yeah. it's just i'm like oh it's okay no judgment <laughs> it's like i mean I, I, I mean some judgment i mean i watch a little bit i watch more nerdy content than she does <laughs> trashy content so you know it yeah. is what it is yeah okay uh, so yeah, um, we watched that. She actually liked it more, surprisingly more than I thought she would hmm. for, you know, a very action. I've heard it's really heavy. well done. Yeah, It is. I mean, it it is really well done. Accolades, and yeah. it feels very real, like a lot of mm-hmm. practical effects. Yeah, um, yeah. It has some scenes in it where I think if it were CG, I wouldn't feel as uncomfortable watching it. But watching it, knowing that like these pilots They're really are, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, feel like I'm kind of, I can understand how uncomfortable I would be in that position. So I'm like yeah. finding myself like, Oh, wow. Making faces like, no, no, mm-mm, not doing that. <laughs> I would be barfing everywhere. Oh, wow. So we watched that. And then we uh, watched, um, as of now, one half of the new Glass Onion movie, which is kind of the sequel to Knives Out with Daniel Craig, the murder mystery. I've heard of thing. that. I've never seen it, but I've heard it's I good. I highly recommend Knives Out. Knives Out? It is okay. a really good movie. Oh, um, so take note of that. This one is the, uh, not a, st- I mean, it is the second installment, not a, not a sequel in terms of story or anything, but uh, yeah. It was, it's uh, so far really good. You know, we haven't concluded the murder mystery part of it, but we will tonight. So that's been fun. We're kind of watching movies in the evenings instead of starting a new show because we just finished the most recent season of The Crown. But Shannon's mm-hmm. got some rehearsals coming up soon. So we're not going to commit to a TV show until she's done with that. So we can kind of. Yeah, because most TV shows now, they're like season long movies. Yeah, yeah. Like, you want to you commit to that, yeah. which is so weird because like after watching House of the Dragon, you know, we were like, oh, my God, and we have to wait two years for another season and it feels wrong because this is the show what, what whatever happened to seasonal shows but yeah. then to your point it's not a show it's a season-long movie yeah like every episode is like a movie and if you were seen. told oh hey here's a new star wars and you'll see a new star wars movie come out in two years you'd be like okay yeah that sounds yeah, normal that makes sense yeah so if you look at it that way two years is total makes sense for a movie yeah but it still feels weird like ah oh, because it does we're just impatient you know there's more you know yeah. Whereas a movie, if a sequel came out, it's like, oh, <clears throat> bonus treat. I didn't know this was going to happen. Okay, so are you a fan of when they, you know, whatever given platform, they release an entire season at once, just drop it all? Yeah. Or do you like when they space it out? Like, Does anybody like it when they space them out? I mean, I have some shows I watch where they space it out, and I, you know, it feels weird because that's not really done anymore. No. Like, we originally don't even have cable. So like, I don't have any no, shows I where don't... I have to do that necessarily, but there are some that that's how they do. Like, you know, Severance on Apple TV yeah. Plus did that. Yeah. Now I, I caught that show like as it was ending. So I ended up binge watching it basically anyway, but I know that's how they're going to do it. And like Ted Lasso is like that, yeah. you know? So there are some shows where they, they eke it out like that. Yeah. And it's like, in a way, it kind of forces you to like appreciate it a little bit more. I feel I agree with that because I, I will just like I'll burn through a show a whole season and then be like, all right, next. And I won't appreciate it. I won't anticipate and like be as invested just because I'm. I'll say if it's a big through. spectacle like House of the Dragon or Game of Thrones, I'll wait a week and watch them week to week. Okay. Because then after that, you get the whole like, oh my gosh, what do you think is going to happen? You mm-hmm. see all the funny tweets about it and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so because it's more of a an experience, right? If it's something like, I don't know, a, like a sitcom, you yeah, know, kind something of like the Great British Baking Show, we love to watch that. But we like that's an that gets released every week, yeah. and we're like, I'm not doing that. I'm or so like, we've got, we we have like Lego Masters, we watch yeah, that. No, we wait for the whole thing to end. We're like, I'm not gonna do a week to week baking show. Once it's done, <laughs> yeah. then we'll watch it. Fair enough. So, but if it's like House of Dragon, that's just like such an actual a, story. Like, yeah, you know. very. So I'll, I'll wait a week for that. But generally, Fair. no, I prefer it when you know we can just watch them when we want to watch them. Yeah. Okay. Because if we do House of the Dragon every Sunday, that means in between we just need to pick something else to watch. Now we're watching two TV shows at the same time, and that's yeah. It's so interesting because I had listened to I can't remember the guy's name, but whoever the founder of Netflix was was doing some interview that I listened to at some point. And they were talking about the whole like binge watching thing and like, you know, dropping a whole season's worth of shows. There wasn't really a plan. He yeah. was just like, once they started producing their own content, they were like, well, 
Why wait? We did them all. So, yeah, let's just drop it all. It was like, it was literally just like, yeah, okay, we'll just drop it. And it ended up changing the landscape. And it ended up of, like, it's yeah. changed how people watch television. And just like, so funny how mm-hmm. like that just, you know, yes, came indeed. to be. Anyway. Uh, Christmas happened. Oh, did it? That's it did. Right. Yeah. It did. That was, that was eventful. Mm. Um, mm. Shannon got me a black denim jacket. A black denim I'm jacket. I'm very excited about. Okay. Because I like wearing my jean jacket all the time. Uh-huh. Um, but is it keeps... like solid black or is yeah. it like an acid wash? Solid black. Kind of black. Okay. Solid black. All right. She always gives me looks when I wear blue denim on blue denim. And oh, while so I will do what I want to do, and she's like, no, 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 you do what you want to do. I still am like, mm. all right, I see I see what you're doing with the Canadian tuxedo. Um, but uh, this one this time, hey, it's black and blue now. So it's, you know, okay. no, no. No issues there. Not like that's the only reason I wanted. I did want a different color denim sure, jacket. So sure. super excited about that. Archer gave me an action figure, Green Lantern, which oh. I actually really wanted. We were in Target okay. one day and I saw this figure. I'm like, dude, that looks really detailed. It looks super poseable. And he was like my Green Lantern. So Hal Jordan is like the Silver Age Green Lantern. So he was the guy in the 80s, um, usually referred to as like the, you know, definitive Green Lantern. Okay. But I was reading comics in the 90s when Kyle Rayner, the artist from Seattle, mm. was the Green Lantern. Mostly okay. people, comic purists, didn't really like him being the new Green Lantern, but he was my boy. Like, I, okay. that, that is my dude. So yeah. I saw him in his original, like, 90s style mm-hmm. suit in Target. I'm like, oh, my boy. So I got really excited about <laughs> nice. that. But I'm like, it's $20. I'm not going to buy an action figure for 20 What am I going to do with him? Right. But, uh, of course, you know, Shannon and Archer were like, Hey, let's go back and get that for him. So that was that was my That's present cool. from Archer. Oh That's yeah, crazy. and I got a toy from my kid. That's perfect. That's awesome. So obviously I got it out of the box. I'm like, this is so cool. I'm like making him do cool poses and stuff. So That's great. Yeah, so that was pretty rad. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, I got Shannon a sweatshirt and a tote bag and an ornament with an artist's rendition of our four corgis on it. Oh. So I hired an artist to do like a cartoony graphic design of um, Ollie who's passed away and then all of our current corgis, Dinah, Felix, and Hank. And uh, mm-hmm. you can basically tell who they are. All of them have pretty good representations of their personalities and looks. Mm-hmm. So she was pretty excited about that. That's cool. Yeah. The, the, the sweatshirt, the print is a little rigid. Um, so I'm kind of not in love with that. It's but not the know, coziest thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the sweatshirt's cozy, but the, the print's very yeah, very yeah. crusty I've and hard. Some, and yeah. Like that, yeah, so I'm hoping after a wash it'll calm down. But you never know when you buy from one of those print places. I think this was a Vista print, and yeah, we'll see. But either yeah. way, I mean, once you have, I have the image, so I can put that on anything. Nice. So yeah, that was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good Christmas. That's it was fun. pretty low key. No big traveling or anything like yeah? that. Yeah, okay. so stayed local. Cool. And then we did Christmas Town uh, <clears throat> last night. So um, uh, Monday night, mm-hmm. uh, it was very very cold. Yes. It was very, very cold. And there, it wasn't super crowded, but I will say that it was very poorly managed. There were hmm. definitely staffing issues. They had two trams mm-hmm. running. So I had to wait 30 was that minutes. Bush, Bush Gardens. Bush right? Gardens, yeah. yeah. Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. Had to wait 30 minutes just to, for that stupid tram to take us to our car at the end of the night, way past the kids' bedtime. Wow. Ugh. Just, and they had so many things that weren't working. So many eating places were not serving. So there was only like two places, three places you could get food. And of course, all of those were totally packed massive lines so we ended up just getting pretzels and it was like sixty dollars oh gosh for yeah. for three pretzels and one drink wow and shannon paid for her cheese like a little cup of pretzel cheese wow 60 bucks Jeez. vile yeah they got you though what are you gonna do parking you want to know how much parking was 20 bucks 30 30 30 dollars to park to park when I mean, you can't even walk back to your car you gotta take a tram yeah Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So honestly, we love going there. We go there every year, but every year it gets more and more expensive. Yeah. And this time we left and we're kind of like, the magic is kind of not there after well, all we're, that. We're just getting to the age too, where it's like, maybe not as special anymore. Yeah. Our mm-hmm. kids are like that at most theme parks. It's like, well, it's not magical. Now it's yeah. their interests are shifting and you and know. It's, it's just happens. so much waiting. And I remember when I did yeah. that Disney Institute training, one of the things they said was that the, one of the reasons they have such a focus on making sure that guests can get to their car quick and easily and they have so many so much staff out in the parking lots is because you can have the best experience the best vacation mm. but if you end it 
on a down note, search, yeah. searching for your car for 45 minutes, feeling lost, it doesn't mm. matter. It all gets overridden by yeah. that last, that final experience. Like how many times have you been to a restaurant mm -hmm. and you've had a great meal, but then you're ready to go, kids are, the, their time limit has expired, yeah. like the and you just, just bring or... me my freaking check. Yeah. Like, yeah. and you, you are now like held hostage. And you're like, it doesn't matter. My food was great. I don't even remember that anymore because I'm just losing my mind because you won't let me leave. Mm. It, that, it just totally cancels out everything. Yeah. It's a bummer. It's tough. It's tough in the service industry right now. Yeah. Like tourism type stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, glad we're not in that business. No, no, no. Personally, but uh, cool. Yeah, what's about, what about? All right. Transition? <laughs> what's up with you? I don't want to I want to take over, but if you're, if no. you're good to go. Take okay. it. Um, yeah, I've had a lot happen. Yeah, I mean, two, it's been, we've been out two weeks, but I've done a lot of random things. Um, so I'm just like, I keep remembering things as you're talking. I'm like, oh yeah, I did this too. Um, so, uh, you know, you went to Bush Gardens. I actually went to King's Dominion, mm. which is, uh, you know, right out of t outside of Richmond here. And, uh, we went there for Ellie's birthday. She wanted to go ice skating cause they do like an outdoor ice skating rink. Oh, like, so where did you they ice skate? Normally, yeah. I, <gasps> I, I, I I literally can't remember the last time I ice skated. It might be high school. Like it might've been that long oh, ago. Oh, yeah. Like, like, I mean, we're in Virginia. You can't really ice skate unless it's indoors. Yeah. So I think there is a rink that's like 20, 30 minutes away. Yeah, there's one in Shore Pump. In Shore Pump, yeah. But it's like, I can't remember the last time I went there, literally. So, so it must be a really, really long time. Um, I went, I, I took, yeah. I made everybody go for my birthday, like, you know, probably nine years ago. Okay. Because I wanted to do ice skating and laser tag. Yeah. No one else wanted to, though. Everybody else was miserable but me. <laughs> but I don't care. It's my birthday. Oh, whatever. You can do that. Yep. Um, ice skating and laser tag. I'm thinking like laser tag on ice if skates only. <laughs> if only that's pretty niche that would be a tough business um yeah so ellie wanted to do that so it's cool they like i mean you want to talk about expensive you got it we have season passes so that helped we already got into the park but then you have to pay for the skating and the mm -hmm. skate rentals and the whole thing so it's like it can add up but you know we have the season passes which includes parking so that was nice yeah season passes um, at bush garden would have included parking yeah, as well but yeah. so it's like if you go a lot but anyway yeah we don't so we went uh ellie went last year for her friend's birthday and she wanted to do it herself for nice. her birthday so did rachel skate too that worked out well she did not okay no. she did last year and she was like no this was awful <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't want to do it this year joseph was up for it he did one lap and was like i'm done and i was like dude come on because he like did one lap as i was still lacing up my skates and then I was like, so you didn't even get to see with like, Joseph? No, I made him do another lap that we did together. <laughs> and he was like, no, I'm really done. Oh, and I was man. like, all right. What, was he like, did he fall a bunch or did he? No, I just didn't. He's, he's inherited Rachel's like, if I'm not interested in it, I'm just not going to do it. And I'm just going to make it known that I'm not having a good time. That is fascinating. And I'm only going to do things I want to do. And I'm like, okay, like, Rachel's trained me for 20 years. Like, you. You don't die on that hill. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but Ellie, she skated the whole time. Oh, my God. The whole time. It was like an hour and a half. And so I was out there with her for most of that time. Wow. But, Did you, you know, hit a groove? You were feeling pretty good on there? I want to say it was pretty rough on my ankles the first couple of yeah. laps. And they're like rental Hitting skates. a groove. I guess that's the wrong term for a skating I mean, rink because there's a lot of groove in those eyes. Well, yeah. I mean, those eyes. I was hitting plenty of grooves. Yeah. You know, and the skates were terrible. There's yeah. like no sharpened on blade at all. And so it's it's pretty difficult. And so, I mean, Ellie was bound and determined though. Like she was skating. She's, you know, it's pretty new to it. Last No one year took any uh, nasty spills. Time. No, no nasty spills. I mean, Ellie fell plenty, but right. she gets right back up. Right. Yeah. You yeah. Know. I didn't fall. I didn't fall not the whole once. time. No. Dang. Ellie all right. did her best to try to make me fall. Because if I was not on purpose, but you know, she was near me, she would like grab right. onto me. Oh god. And she's not the smallest kid anymore. No, you know, no, she's no. this is her eleventh birthday. Lady. So yeah, you know, when she grabs onto me, she's you know, she's got like more of my build. Uh -huh. So like she's she's very strong, very, you know, forceful when she's <laughs> wanting to do something. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, we skated together, but we had a great time. So that there's a cool, cool, like bonding thing, like more me and her because Joseph and Rachel oh, were yo, not. Jo Rachel was bonding with Joseph in their yeah. defiance. Yeah. Actually, we, <laughs> we so we ran into my sister and her family. We didn't know that they were going. What? We had planned to go. So they decided to join us like, cause they oh, were already wow. there. So my niece, it would end up being her first time ever ice skating. So I got to be there for that. And Joseph got to hang out with his cousin and all that. So it kind of worked out well. That was cool. Yeah. So that was fun. We did that. And then we rode a couple of rides. It was like 20 degrees outside. It was 
freezing. Why would you do that? The kids wanted to ride some stuff. Oh my and, god! You know, it's cool. They like have all the kinds of lights and stuff decorated for winter and all that. We did do fun. bumper cars yesterday. Yeah. So, but that, you're like barely moving. Yeah. That that's what. No, that, we I did would... some things where you're like spinning oh, around, no. and my face was like, oh, it's so cold. Oh god! You know, where you're like crying because you're like, oh, no, tears no, are so no. cold. Yeah. But anyway, it was fun. I love doing stuff like that. So. That was fun. Um, and then we actually ended up going out of town right after that. So we went up to visit Rachel's family. So they came down for us for Thanksgiving. You know, we mix it up, you know, depending on what's going on with all the different in-laws and all the families and stuff. So this year worked out better for us to go before Christmas and leave basically on Christmas day, come back. And it was so cool because like my kids are old enough now where we can like speak to them more like weighing in their opinion about when we do like family stuff. Right. Whereas, you know, when your kids are younger, like, well, this is what the family's doing. Yeah. You're along for the ride. Your opinion doesn't matter because you're going to throw a fit anyway. So. Exactly. That's that's where we are not with Archer. Factoring, like, not giving you a heads up, not factoring you in. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. If we ask Archer, hey, do you want to go out and do this? It's always going to be no. He doesn't yeah. ever want to go anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. So you don't ask what restaurant they want to eat at because it's no. like, no, we can't have pizza 12 nights in a row. Um, so, you know, but this one, it was like, Rachel was kind of you know, she was like, we're coming back on Christmas day. She's like, we got so, like all the kids presents and everything. She's like, maybe we should take two cars up there or something to carry it on. I was like, no, no, that is not, I'm not doing that. And that traffic. Like, no way am I dealing with that. So I was like, what if we didn't bring the kids presents up there? Like they opened up the presents from like her parents and her sister's family, but we waited until we got back home and then did all our presents at home. Mm. That way we don't have to cart it back and forth. Cause like, we're gonna cart all that stuff up there. They're not gonna be able to play with it. They're gonna open it on Christmas and then we're just hauling it all back. They yeah. won't even get to use any of it. Yeah. So when your kids are younger and it's like, there's all that magic around the whole, you know, yeah. the whole thing. And you're like, well, we gotta do this wildly impractical thing because right. of that, whatever. But we just like sat the kids down a couple of days before we went on the trip and like, hey kids, we were thinking about this. And what do you guys think if we did it that way? And they're like, oh yeah, that totally makes more sense. We'll just like, not you know wait and do like a second christmas nice. the next day and like then my parents are in town so I, like we invited my parents Look at over that. and they were logical attitudes and the kids were like super flexible i was like man this is so much nicer than having to do all this like ridiculous rigmarole absolutely so that was very nice and being able to do reasonable rational things with our I kids i love that i love like the older <laughs> the kids get the better it is like yeah, i know it's <laughs> easy to reminisce about like oh they're so cute while we were at bush gardens christmas town mm -hmm. Shannon was flipping through some phones that we had when Archer was a baby there. And she was like, oh, I remember when he was in his little bear costume. I was like, yeah, he was mad. Yeah. He was, he a was nightmare. crying. He was always like, oh, no, look. And she was bringing up pictures like, look at the bear, look at the bear. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he was mad. And then she keeps flipping and eventually, oh, yep, the, yep. crying, crying, crying. Mm. She's like, oh, yeah, he was. I was like, yeah, it yeah, was awful. He was a nightmare, yeah. I was like, don't, don't <laughs> get confused. It was terrible. It's like, yeah, he was a cute, he was dressed as a little cute little fuzzy bear, but yep. he was pissed the whole time. Yep. Mm -mm. Yep. Um, so while, you know, then we went up to, so we went up to Rachel's family. It was great. We had a great visit. Nobody was that ill, though there's like plenty of colds and stuff now. It's oh, yeah. like a little, you know, and that's going to happen. It was freaking cold though. Like I know there's that Arctic blast or whatever it's called that was happening across most of the it's U.S. Sub-Zero special moves in yeah, Mortal Kombat. Yeah, exactly. So it, it wasn't like, it wasn't like we were that, I mean, we're still in Virginia. We were in Northern Virginia which, but it was a little colder than here. Oh but, yeah. I mean, it was like sub zero temperatures, yeah. which is crazy, but it was a lot colder in other parts. And I'm not trying to get right, a sob yeah. story here, but it was very cold for where we were at. Um, but anyway, so um, got to do one cool thing. So Rockler is a like woodworking specialty store uh, that I've, you know, followed and looked, shopped online and stuff like that. But they have like a physical store in Fairfax now. Oh. And like the next closest one is in like Pennsylvania or New Jersey or something. Oh, wow. So like last time we were up there, they had just opened the store and I went there before. So this time I was like, I would love to go back, especially like Christmas time. They might have some deals and stuff. So I went there with my brother-in-law. We were able to sneak away. And go there, and that's where you talked about restraint. Ah. That's where I found some restraint because they have like lots of exotic woods and stuff like oh, that. Man. They have this gorgeous piece of wood, and I was like, I literally can't buy like an eight foot piece of lumber and bring that back home. Oh. Like it's just not going to make any sense. And it I was only like, came in eight feet. I mean, it was like it was a particular piece that oh. like, was very captivating to me. Oh, but man. I was like, I was like, no, I can't do it. But I, I went back to the piece of wood like seven times. Oh, because it was. So it's this wood called Purple Heart. It's, yeah. it's a naturally purple wood, yeah. but it was figured purple heart. So it had this like ribbony kind of texture to it. 
that I've never seen a piece that looked like that. Oh, so it was just like that particular piece of wood. I was like, I may not see something like this again, but I was like, no, nah, I just can't do it. What would you have so, done with it? I don't know. I yeah. don't need it. I have so much wood, I can't even like stand it. Yeah. <laughs> so like I'm a wood hoarder. So it was like, it's kind of like when you see a beautiful pen, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to have this pen. You're like, yeah. oh my, I don't need any more pens. Yeah. It's ridiculous. How am I justifying this? So I like, nope, not going to do it. So I didn't. Did you get anything? No, oh, I got plenty of other stuff. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I got plenty of other stuff. What you else know, you like, get? Some, some, what, what, I got like clamps and, you know, various you things like that. Did you I didn't get any wood. No, no wood. wood. Oh, no wood. Okay. No wood. What, what thing that did tools. you get there that you're the most excited about using? Hmm, most excited about? Mm, I had an impulse buy uh, right at the end there that was like a, it was like a half off thing of like a stem, like little kit. So it's like this wooden like cutout thing of like a, a uh, what's it called? Trebuchet. So it's like a little tabletop trebuchet. Thing. So nice. I'm sure it's a piece of garbage, but I was like, you know, I can like build it. There you go. It's like, that'd be kind of fun. Oh yeah. It's like nine bucks. And I was like, okay, that's we'll, cool. we'll spring for that. So have you yeah, built, we'll build haven't, haven't built it yet. Haven't built it yet okay. because they got all their other presents. And I was like, this thing was like, you know, it wasn't okay. even a present that I gave them. I was like, Hey kids, I just bought this thing. All right. Well, you got to let us know. So we want like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we want a video of the trebuchet in action. We'll try it. I'm fully expecting it to be a hot pile of garbage. We'll so. Get Joseph to build some sort of Lego <laughs> target. There you go. Ah, I like that. There like we go. Um, I did a little woodworking. So I, I talked a while ago about building a headboard for my nephew. Yeah, yeah. We saw some early well, picks. Yeah. So I finished it. Nice. I was, I was trying to finish it so that we could bring it up there. So this was to add to the You had enough room stuff. to bring the headboard and all that? Yeah. Well, he's oh only got gosh. a twin bed. So it was just a headboard for a twin bed. It was like three feet wide. So, so it was like manageable. But still, I was trying to fit a headboard yeah. in there. And uh, yeah. So the... the, the we made it up there. Just you like the way it came out? I'm very happy with how it came nice. out. Nice. Yeah. So I'll, have, I'll throw some pictures up on here, but it worked out really well. And they loved it. And he loved it. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. It was what a, a gift. It was a good, it was a good, good time. Oh, for sure. That's yeah. Fantastic. And now I can get that big thing out of my shop. So there we I'll go. get some more space back. So I was like trying desperately to like get that thing done before we went up there. But I was under the weather and I traveled and I had all this stuff going on. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get it done, but I did. Nice. So I'm very glad. For Congratulations. That. That's awesome. Yeah. And then we talked about like movies and Christmas movies and stuff like that. I talked about White Christmas is mm -hmm. like one of the ones. Well, we ended up watching it with Rachel's family. Nice. But it was really funny because we've watched it with our kids before. I don't know if my, well, I guess my niece and nephew have seen it, but they're like getting a little older and a little more cognizant too. But like we watched it as a family, but like everybody's getting a little older now. And for whatever reason, we were all just being kind of like snarky and sarcastic oh, no. about the movie, just commenting about like how many plot holes there are and just all the ridiculous parts of it, you know? So it was, it was felt like a, like a mystery science 3000 oh, kind gosh. of a, kind yes. of a vibe. So it was pretty fun because, you know, we were, my brother-in-law and I was like doing the dishes and everybody was kind of doing the whole thing, but we were like snarking on the movie. Like, why are you making time. such a mess in the dining car with all that salt and ruining? Yeah, exactly. Someone else could, someone could have used that napkin. What are you doing? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> It's like, oh, so you're going to like break up your act with your sister, like leave town, go and get another job when you could have just like asked a clarifying question right. to the guy that you <laughs> have the feelings for to clear up the confusion of the situation. Like, no, I refuse to like learn anything right. more about this situation. I'm just going to change my whole life and then go to a different. I'm like, this is so ridiculous. I was <laughs> reading a, a, a string of uh, comments about actors that were deceptively the uh, similar ages, but played characters that were oh, yeah. farther apart. And one of them that came up was oh. the general and being Crosby's character. Right. Apparently they were like, you know, they're like maybe, almost the same age. Yeah. I think it was like eight years, eight, yeah. you know, not a lot, not, not nearly as much as was. Yeah. You know, make out the general to be like this, like crusty old coot. That's right. Like about right. To die. No, I think he was like eight, eight, maybe 10 years older than him. Yeah. It wasn't, a, it wasn't, I think Crosby ton. wasn't super young. It was, it was kind of like the, just the difference between Harrison Ford and uh, Sean Connery in last crusade. It was about a 10 year difference. Oh, okay. But you're not going to have a they 10 year old father. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Still a good movie though. Oh yeah. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I found out like my own, I, I've been working on this like the last several times I've gone up to visit my in-laws about like, you know, cause I, I, I'm used to like doing so much stuff here at home. And when I go up there, like there's not work, there's not, you know, any of the stuff to do around the house. So I, I get a bit kind of antsy. Right. And you don't have enough so, portable gaming systems then. Well, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I sort of do, but it, like, you know, that's my ticket. True. true. God forbid I have to be social. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, so I, I think I finally found, like, what is my, like, sweet spot for going to visit my in-laws? Uh, it's doing home projects for them. 
So oh. like, you know, they are, they're in more like a suburban area. They don't have the same kind of tools and, you know, experience that I have, but I love doing stuff, moving around. It's good for my body. It's good for me mentally. And like, I'm trying to incorporate that just much more regularly into my life. And they like are just loving it. Was they, it mostly like, fixing stuff or improving? Um, This trip, it was some slight stuff. Like um, they needed a microwave replaced. So my brother-in-law and I did that together. Um, I've actually replaced four above range microwaves in the last like 16 months. Usually microwaves don't really go bad. What? Just like we needed to replace ours. My parents did, had, did, had did, moved a did while ago. Did it die ago. or? Um, theirs was like the handle was all broken oh, off. Okay. And usually yeah, microwaves was, last like longer than you want them to. Uh, some of them, the newer ones are crappier. Oh, though, really? So they don't last quite as long. Oh, okay. Yeah, but for just various reasons, you know, they need to be replaced. Um, Rachel and I never had an above range microwave. So we had a like, tabletop one or yeah, whatever I miss you ours. don't have one i miss ours yeah, we have so one in like, my old house yeah so it's like we were like what would it look like and ours was like starting to fall apart because it was actually like a hand me down from rachel's parents like 10 years ago oh, and wow. we've been using it for 10 years yeah right they, they don't die. yeah they usually can go quite a while quite a ways so we you know we did that so i had all this experience I was like i can easily help you replace a microwave um so we did that they had like you know they've got young kids that like pull on the curtain rods and they're like pulling the drywall out oh, of the thing. So yeah. just like patching stuff like that. I have to do that with my son's These types uh, of towel holder right yep. now. Cause yep. you know, rather than gently lifting the towel off, no, you need to pull the towel. It. Yep. Yep. It happens. It so happens. I need to get some larger anchors. In there. Yep. There you go. These had like ripped the drywall. So I need to like patch the drywall. It was like a bigger oh, thing. I need to do that with my right. bathroom fan Yeah. because I just, I re nothing got ripped. I just yeah. replaced it and it, it's got like a gap in there to the attic mm -hmm. now. It's disgusting. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't want to do drywall though. I need to, it's not that, it's not so like bad, that. but it's, it's a lot of steps. It's, then we get, it's annoying to do little drywall things because you still have to do all the steps, ugh. you know? So you gotta I, like cut it, you gotta patch it, you gotta sand the compound and do the paint and, I don't, and the whole thing. I don't want to have a bucket of drywall mud. I don't need it. <laughs> and I have to put it somewhere. Yeah, ugh. it's true. And you can't really buy a small one. No. It's like $4 for a giant bucket. But I then don't it's want like, it. You gotta do it. I don't want it. it. I hate caulk because like sometimes you need a little bit of caulk. Oh, and then just the next time you need it, it dries gonna, out. Yeah. Yep. So it's like I now most of the time with caulk, if I'm doing like a little repair job, I just buy like the squeezable tube. I'm like, I don't even care if it costs the same amount. You know, if it's no. less, like I'll just squeeze it waste. and then I'm throwing out less of it. Yeah, I need to buy some of that too for the yeah. uh, outdoor lights I need to install. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yep. So all that stuff that you like that you don't want to have to do. Imagine if your in-laws came to visit and just did that stuff for you. That's basically what I'm doing. That sounds them. fantastic. Right? That does. So I'm like, I'm happy because I got stuff to do. I get to like fix stuff and, you know, show the kids how to do random things. I'm making their life better. They don't get to stress about Man, it. I wish I could borrow some of, some of that excitement for home improvement <laughs> that you have. It's a gift. It's Ugh. a gift. I don't have a lot of strengths, but that's one of them. So um, that was good. Anyway, so I really enjoyed that. And then kind of the creme de la creme or whatever the whatever the to top the, off the, the whole the, the coup de creme coup de creme sure <laughs> that coup de gras is that creme, coup de gras? creme de la creme coup de, yeah sure yeah the yeah, all gratin yeah. coup, de, coup de creme <laughs> um <laughs> uh I finally taught Rachel how to play chess. <gasps> you finally did it yeah before the end of the year yeah you it did it last night or yesterday uh, and actually, my parents ended up visiting, and my dad had commented about maybe learning how to play. And I was like, oh, I'm literally going to teach Rachel. So neither of my parents knew how to play chess. Oh. So my mom knew what the pieces were, but they didn't really know how to play. So I taught all three of them at the same time. And uh, yeah. So now Rachel, I mean, she, it was, it was an interesting dynamic trying to teach three people at once because, like, you know, they all learned at different speeds. Oh, think, yeah. Yeah, Rachel you know, could have moved things along a little quicker probably. Uh, and she's like, after visiting all the family and stuff, she's starting to like feel a little bit under the weather. Oh, so, yeah. you know, she was like dealing with some like sinusy things while trying to learn it. And I was oh, like, yeah. she was, so she, to her credit, she was really hanging in there. She'd be in a trooper. She was being a trooper. Excellent. But she hung in there for a couple hours. We, you know, whenever it played a couple hours. Like, yeah. Cause I had to explain a lot of Ugh. everything. And then we played through a game and like talk through all the moves. So, um, it, you know, normally it wouldn't take quite as long, but teaching three people at once, it took a little longer. But, yeah. So, you know, when I picked up we'll, Archer we'll from, uh, he stayed with my mom and uh, her husband. Mm. And uh, when I picked them up, I saw that a chessboard was out halfway through the game. He was mm -hmm. playing chess with uh, my stepdad. Really? I didn't even know he knew I played chess. That's or he told cool. me he did, but I didn't believe him. Right. But no, uh, Kids can pick it up quick. According to Larry, he was like, no, our, we're, we're pretty much uh, dead even. I was like, what? So Yeah, yeah. kids can pick it up he quick. Seems to, he seems to enjoy it. 
it's a lot of fun. I'm in, I'm enjoying kind of rediscovering it and the kids can play it. And I'm, I'm like crossing my fingers that like Rachel will want to play it again. Cause like I told her that was like kind of the Christmas gift I wanted was for her to just like learn how to play. Um, so we'll see, but I, it's like, because she's under the weather now, I don't want her to be like, no, this game's yeah, don't, not don't, for don't, me. Don't, don't so push I'm it at not, this point. Not yeah. pushing it. Good not call. Pushing it, Good but, call. You know, we'll see. And I'm like, want to build a chessboard so bad now. So that might be my next um, project. <laughs> we, ha- we had a listener, um, Pencast person, yeah. send me a picture of the one that he made. Yeah. Um, and uh, no gapping after after years using nice. two different types of woods. Okay. Yeah. It can be done. So it can be done. All right. It can be All done. All right. Well, let's see. I'm scoping out the wood and, you know, doing some things. That wood that I passed on could have made for a good chessboard. but. Could have made for like 12 good chess Right, I was about to say, it seems like it was a bit overkill. But anyway, so that was fun. Do you not have any Purple Heart already? I have some, but it's not highly figured or anything. It's just like, and see Purple Heart over time, it kind of browns, like it loses its purple Mm. color and it turns more of a purpley muddy kind of brown. Oh. So that's why I don't love Purple Heart for like ornamentation is because it does, it's one of those woods that like- So what do you like it for then? It just looks- I mean, it's, it's a very hard wood. Oh, okay. So it's like for certain, you know, like they use it a lot. I mean, not around here because it's got to be imported, but it makes for like really good flooring and, you know, like a very gotcha. durable. It can be oh, good okay. for things like cutting boards and stuff like oh, that. Oh, okay. So you didn't need that big piece anyway. No. Yeah. So it's like. Unless you're going to make something, some tool. But like it, it looks so beautiful just as the piece of wood. Yeah. yeah. So it would be good for that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I don't know what I practically would have used it for. So I passed on it, but there's. Dude, you should do an axe handle. I've done um, I've done a hatchet before. Oh, you did? Have I never shown you that? Like you you, you mounted the thing and you yeah hammered the whole, in the little did the whole thing. thing. Oh, yeah. that looks so oh, yeah. cool. Oh yeah, I did it. I'll have to show it to you. Yeah, I'll have to show it to you. Yeah, I bought like a little because you can buy like at least like rockler and like woodcraft and stuff like that. You can buy like kits. It's like yeah. whether it's not you know chef's knives and ice cream scoops and like all kinds of random thing. You buy the metal bit and then you turn whatever the thing or cut the whatever the piece of wood. So yeah, I did that with like a, it's like a small like camping hatchet. That sounds so cool. Oh, it was cool. Like little hammers and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Oh man, you could totally oh, yeah. do both all kinds of, of stuff. All kinds of stuff. That's rad. Yep. Yep. Anyway, so that's my stuff. Home projects, things like that. So, all right, that's it for the what's happening. Got a couple company updates and we'll wrap this thing up. All right. Well, we are mostly through our holidays, but we still have a couple, a few, one. We have a whole year to through. finish. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, when this publishes, it'll be what? The 29th or 30th or whatever? Uh, but whatever. It'll be almost the end of the year. So happy 20, 20, end of 2022, everybody. Um, so we're, we were closed Friday last week for Christmas. We take two days off for Christmas. We were closed last Friday and this Monday because Christmas fell on Sunday. We're going to be closed on Monday because New Year's is falling on a Sunday too, I think, right? Yes. So that's kind of weird. So we're going to be closed on Monday. So it makes for weird weeks for us. Which I forgot until today. Yeah. <laughs> because here's the thing. I had told you, oh, no, I thought we had Friday off. Oh, because, you know, my wife's got Friday off. Yeah, yeah. It turns out I went home for my lunch break today. She's uh-huh. like, oh, yeah, by the way, I don't get Friday off. I get Monday off. It's Monday. Monday. I was like, really? Okay. So we were both. You were both wrong. Totally wrong. Thinking that the other Dude. person had no. Friday off. But you were but yeah. no it, it, Archer does have off, so his his okay, his okay. program is closed. So gotcha. we had both just we're stupid, just okay. God. <laughs> it happens. Hopeless. It I happens. don't know how how we've survived this long. It's kind of funny, yeah. yeah. But you know, hey. So anyway, so we'll be closed on Monday. Our team has been pretty caught up on things, so I don't think it's going to disrupt too much. No, but, no, they're, um, they're, they're they're great. We should be in pretty good shape. Um, and then we have a couple of videos that we've uh, put out. So we did uh, hottest inks of the year, which is always fun. We'll still be in our sweater attire uh, because we shot those before the holidays. Uh, and then hottest pens of the year as well should have just gone out by the time we publish this video. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and then we'll have even more videos coming out. We got a pretty good schedule coming out for the next January. So more things on the horizon, but no, that's pretty much all I got. Ate way too many cookies. So we're going to lean it up now. I had a smoothie for lunch today. I was like, I got to get some vegetables in me. (laughs) Eating way too many carbs. Anyway, let's wrap this thing up, shall we? Well, we want to thank everybody for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions and whatnot in the comments uh, so we can answer them on the show. Now that you know how Drew picks them, 
Uh, check out goodlypens.com for fountain pen ink, pens, picture, paper, whatever, pictures. Picture paper. Pictures of paper and other things. <laughs> uh, like and subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all these places. You can email us at pencast at goulaypens.com for general feedback, questions, and such things. And I have a random fun fact. Bring Since it. New Year's is right around the corner. It is. Are you like a New Year's resolution person? Uh, sometimes. I'm very realistic in my resolutions. Sometimes. Like one year I was like, I need to replace all of my, you know, flush mount light fixtures in my home. And, you know, I did it for the most part. So Is that really like a resolution or is that more of like a... It's mostly just giving myself to-do a list deadline. <laughs> okay, fair know? enough. So no, nothing like, oh, I need to lose this much weight or I want to get yeah. a six pack of abs. No, I don't. Not. You're not big into like the... I'm not lofty. I'm, I'm making this no. life changing. No, I did situation. I did say something next year about something I wanted to do, but it is very attainable, even though I forgot what it was. I feel like we said something on the pen cast. Like, or I know I've said in previous videos before about like whether, you know, cause I remember one time it was like, I want to get more into woodworking and, and be able to do some stuff. Oh, with we my talked kids. about, I, I, I said that I wanted to get in, get into a journaling habit. Yeah. And you did try that. Are, are still trying? No, I said I'd do it in 2023. It? I need to buy another. Oh, okay. uh, I need to buy okay. another five year journal. Which oh, okay. I'm not going to say that's a resolution because that is too lofty. I've already failed at that, so I'm like, mm -mm, I'm not going to do that. Do, just the resolution is to get the five year. The journal? resolution <laughs> is to write something down every day. Okay. Get into some that's sort a, of that's a, a resolution. Rhythm. Yeah. I'm that's... not going to say it's my re resolution though because I'm almost certain I'm going to fail. Oh, okay. So I don't like that. Well, that's okay. I mean, that's most. I need to. Resolutions. I need. I, I, yeah, I want to feel confident about my re resolution though. Fair enough. Fair so enough. if it's something that, you know, just requires, you know, less willpower and mm. more just would action na would naturally happen anyway. Maybe something just like <laughs> I, I just I, I want to do something I'm already planning on doing. We just need a little bit of uh, a little bit of accountability. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. But that that mm, I'm not optimistic about the writing. Fair enough. Would you say that you're? Maybe... I didn't even take any pictures of Christmas morning when Archer was opening his presents. I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, I'm already disappointed. Like, how yeah, in the world? We didn't, we didn't do any like real family pictures. Right? We even got like some matching pajamas and stuff. Like Rachel bought matching pajamas, and we didn't do a picture. Yeah, just Terrible. didn't didn't feel like it. We were like, who is this for? Really? We don't care. Yeah. But she bought the job. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we, we got a <laughs> picture happens. of Archer and the dogs, but not none of Shannon or yeah. I. Fair enough. Well, I, would you say that you're maybe 46% of the time having a resolution? No, less, kind of your, much less than less that. Less than that? All right, In well, fact, the, the, the lighting fixture one is the only one I can actually remember okay. having well, made. Then, then you're bringing the average down because apparently 46% of Americans set New Year's resolutions. Though I've read other statistics that like 80% of people like give up on them after three weeks or something like that. Mm. Um, but uh, I was curious what the top five New Year's resolutions were Ooh. for 2022. Mm. So this past, so I couldn't find anything on like what people's top resolutions are forthcoming, probably okay. because it's not 2023 yet. L losing weight, right? Um, losing weight is in the top five. Okay. Uh, getting a new job? Uh, career or job goals okay. is one of them, yep. Cutting off a family member. Um, there was uh, personal improvement or happiness. Mm. Would that fall under that maybe? No. Oh, there, there was one like personal relationships that felt like it was like six or seven or something mm. like that. Yeah. Cutting off a family member is a very specific maybe one. <laughs> it's just people uh, I know. <laughs> I'm going to finally just um, stop responding to that guy. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So I'll go through the list. So number one was living healthier. 23%. Oh, okay. Yeah, that covers so that, a lot. That, that covers a lot. Um, <clears throat> personal improvement or happiness is 21%, also a bit general. This is all according to Statista. Uh, losing weight uh, was 20%. Career or job goals, 16%. And then financial goals, 13%. Hmm. So broad categories, but yeah. you know, that's generally what uh, people were going for. Mine was very specific last year. I think I said I wanted to learn how to weld. Oh. And I totally friggin nailed that yeah, one. Not one one could say you went too far i yeah <laughs> so i i would be in the whatever i've not only set a resolution i destroyed it and i mean literally i welded yesterday so still still at it so yeah anyway i'm surprised you haven't uh I wanted don't... to forge anything i mean now, now that you wanted to or would actually do because i mean if different. you can do a hammer and a hatchet handle. I have a. All you need to do is just. I have make... a sixty-six pound anvil, like a small benchtop anvil. I have, I mean, I I have a benchtop hydraulic press, so I bend metal, 
And I have you ever like crushed things with it? I have heated metal and bent it and hammered it and things like that. So you you're know, almost there. Kind of like blacksmith the, Brian. It's like the IKEA assembly furniture you equivalent start somewhere. of forging. But you gotta start somewhere. You know, yeah, I, you, I've seen people. I've do watched some like crazy Forge and Fire, and I've watched some. You know, um, I can't remember the British guy on YouTube that does all the crazy metal forging and builds crazy like maces and weapons and stuff. Mm. I don't remember the guy. He's got glasses. Young guy. Mm-mm. I don't remember. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, I totally would be into that, but I gotta. I can only have so many. Hobbies. So, do you have a resolution this year? I, I was trying to think about that. I don't have no, anything yet. Not yet. I don't know. We'll see. But if y'all have any uh, resolutions or any ideas, you know, by all means, drop them in the comments. We'd love to see them. So, I figured like next week is when I'd feel the pressure to like say any kind of resolution. But I usually don't think about it very deeply. But you know, that's how the welding one was, and here I am. Here you Multiple are. welders now doing it more than I would have thought. And that's all we got for this week. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of the year. We'll see you next year. (laughs) Yes. Right on. Yes.